Salem! Homawa is the biggest festival among the Gans, celebrated annually between the month of August and September. The phrase Homawa emanates from two Ga words, Homo, which means hunger, and Wo, which means to hoot at. Together, the word means hooting at hunger. The festival is commemorated to mark the victory of the Ga people over hunger they experienced during their migration. During the celebration, there is great display of Ga heritage and culture and the festival attracts people from all walks of life. Whereas the Homowo festival is generally celebrated on different days by the various Ga groups, there are pre-celebrating activities prior to the major event which is marked on Saturday. This year's festival began with the Gamashi people who marked the Sobi celebration on Thursday in honor of all Ga Thursday bonds. Thursday bonds on this day carry foodstuff in a procession amidst singing while they march to the palace of the Gamanche near Takite Kutakent. Friday began with the Twin Festival. This is marked on the Friday before Homowo in honor of all twins. It is believed that the rituals performed during this ceremony not only honor the spirits of the twins but imbues into them confidence to attain self-fulfillment and psychological peace. The Yam Festival begins early on Friday morning in all the respective compounds where twins are residing. Traditionally, the Nai Wolomo is the first to prepare the concoction before the various houses where twins reside can take their turns. After this, the elderly people in every household prepare the concoctions for their households. A tuber of yam is cut into small pieces and placed into a pan with some herbs and seawater. They are mixed with schnapps and eggs and in some cases colon to help give a good smell. The concoction is believed to induce fertility and eggs are used because they symbolize fertility in the Ga culture. Prayers are recited. <laughs> After this, two white fowls are slaughtered, one after the other, and each slaughtered fowl is thrown backwards, and the manner in which the fowl falls is significant. At least one of the fowls is supposed to fall on their backs. If both fowls fall on their bellies, it is a sign of bad omen. This is done upon an appeal to the gods to forgive them of their shortcomings. The water is used to purify the twins or is smeared on some parts of their bodies. After this, any other person who may want twins or goodwill proclaims what they want and donates some money and some of the water is used to purify them. Not everyone has the privilege of having twins, so when God gives you twins, He has graced you and so you have to take good care of them. This is why we perform these rituals every year. The twin festival is now more enjoyable. Participation wasn't that great before, but now we celebrate it more than the Homo People come from far to experience it. The church has been lying to us, and since we are very few, once someone becomes convinced, the others also stop. When you have visitors during the period, you ask them what they prefer to eat and then you prepare it for them. 
Twins are seen as animals who fight in the womb. So once they come out of the womb and they are performing purification rituals for them, they put the horns of the sheep sacrificed aside and it is cleansed every year when they bath them. Also, with the concussion prepared, people say their wishes over the money they donate and then put it in the bowl. It is believed that by the following year, what you asked for should have come to pass. The Twin Festival will continue. We won't stop today, we won't stop tomorrow. It is also humans who wrote the Bible and introduced Christianity to us. The various families make merry in their homes with feasting following this. The twins, their parents and all other relatives all dress in white clothes later and parade the town to show their joy. During the procession, young twins who cannot participate are carried on the shoulders of older family members. The remnants of the concoction are taken to a spiritual house near Agbogoloshi, where the content is empty. Since the beginning of the, 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 the Ga people, it is one of the major um, activities of tradition and culture of the Ga people. And also, it helps maintain and stabilize the, the twins when they are giving birth to. And also, it is also one of the major factors in the life of the twins that they bring good omen and then they bring. Um, very good and then blessings to the family so this thing serves as appreciation to them and then a year of uh, request because when this uh, helps are put together people that comes to bath with it with their request that subsequent years it manifests and then they comes to give them Saturday is the main ceremony and is usually patronized by many. The occasion is characterized by pomp and pageantry. On this day, sprinkling of food is done by the chiefs of the garland. This is done to hoot at hunger and also to bless the gods for abundant food. For the Gamashi Homowo, the Gbese Manche is tasked with sprinkling the popoi. Popoi is prepared primarily with steamed fermented corn, palm nut soup, and smoked fish. The corn is pounded, mixed with the palm nut soup, and mashed with the smoked fish. After this, the Gbese Manche, Niai Bonte II, parades through the streets and every royal home and sprinkles the popoi. He is followed by sub cheese from different Ga areas and residents of the area amidst dancing and drumming. High Commissioner to Ghana, who participated in the 2022 Homo War and was crowned Development Queen of Bese, expressed excitement about the colorful occasion. Harriet Thompson, who now bears the Sioux name Na Okaicho Mlami the First, Bese Noya Manye, had this to say. Mother for the Best Kingdom. So it's in that capacity that I'm taking part today. And the theme 
humour today. The Fed celebrating the end of a period of hunger. It reminds us to think back about what people, what's happened to people who've gone before us. The values and the traditions that we still must respect today. But also the joy of the end of that period of hunger. And the determination that we still have now to work together to ensure that people don't go hungry in the future. The Gbese Manche rounds up his procession at the Ga Manche's palace where he reports to the Ga Manche, Ni Takite Kuchuru II, that his work is done. I was the one who went to sprinkle the Kwekwe first because I am the leader and I have made them aware that I have finished and so it paves the way for any other chief to do same. Today's celebration has been different from all others. Today the crowd was massive. There was unity and love. God bless everyone who came to participate and those who couldn't. This year's has been special. There was no violence. We should be merry, but not to the extent of being drunk and causing mayhem. I ask for life. Bese is moving forward. We are not coming backwards. So anything that will disrupt the peace, I will step in myself. All Bese people should come and help with the peace and development of Bese. Bese belongs to all of us, so we will mend any broken bridges. The same way I went ahead to sprinkle the Kukui, I'm the first to speak so that those who couldn't come can also see that peace prevails. Other residents and leaders in the community also express their thoughts about the occasion. The Bese Palace and area has become beautiful. It wasn't always like this, but this year it has been revamped. We are celebrating in peace. We have no issues with anyone and vice versa. We urge all to cooperate and we hope that it goes on the same way so we will all live in peace. Blessings upon Bese Manche. If the Bese Manche stands, Kamashi stands. It is important that he gathers all the small towns for you. The smaller towns make the school great, and if all the others stand, 
the stool will also stand. And the youth will get profitable work to do after school. All these are important to him and it is his desire that is happening. He is bigger than all of us and we ask God to guide him. We greet all chiefs. We pray this year bring us good tidings. If there is a hole in a tree, every animal can enter. But if there is no hole, Gbese stands. So if the Gbese Manche says he is bringing together all the villages and small towns for peace and unity to prevail and for wrongs to be made right so that we can celebrate bigger next year, I ask for life for all seven houses in Gbese. After this, any other sub-chief has the permission to sprinkle the Kokoi in their respective areas. at Eden Gardens and just so you know this is not the biblical garden that was home to God's first creation of man and woman Adam and Eve but right here in Accra we are presented with a close opportunity to what it felt like to be in such a garden and that has been made possible by our guests on this week's edition of the Untold here on Ghana Web TV with me Eche Atisu. Mrs. Alberta Ekusika Ado is the owner of Eden Gardens and the interesting thing about her story is that this woman speaks to plants. You want to find out more? Come along with us. My name is Alberta Ekusika Ado. But I like it when people call me Ekusika. Because I believe the Sika will one day manifest. It will see on my body. Yeah, so I was born on the 8th of March 1970 to late parents. Mr. and Mrs. Amwa Brown of blessed memory. Her schooling years were filled with a lot of home training as well because as she says you cannot run away from family business. My mom was a caterer so she really wanted me to help her in the family business which I didn't want her to but you know you can never say no to your mom so I had to I had to do that before then I really wanted to go to the nursing school which I couldn't because she really wanted me to help her so I went to Takradi Polytechnic after that I worked with Panian Tobacco Company for some time had my own restaurant on the Agwiglosu Road in the premises of Ahmed Coal Store that place belonged to um, Edward Akufuado, the, the president's brother. There was so much work at home most of the time, so much that even when she was at the boarding house in school, she needed to return home on weekends to help out. When I, I was in straight to secondary school, because my mom is a caterer, a big one of course, 
every Friday after school, I need to take an exit to come home. When I'm in the boarding house, you will come home every Friday because Saturday you have to go and mount wedding cake. Then Sunday we are cooking for say from 200 people, either for lunch or for dinner. Before Sunday evening, I go back to Kaneshi to catch a bus back to school. So that was what was happening. It's not like, you know, um, in sometimes in school over the weekend, you have time with friends, talking and all that. But for me, yes, we had that time too. So we can go for entertainment and all that. But certain times, I need to take Ezia to go home. My mom would even talk to the headmaster that maybe such and such a day, Alberta will have to come home on a Friday. So if you could grant her an exit. Growing up in a house full of plants, little Ekusika grew up learning many tricks about tending to plants. Her love for plants also naturally came along. When I was around seven years old, in my home in Dansuman, we have lots of plants. What we see here is just something small. And being the little girl among the boys, I was the one who would water the plants, prune, cut, do anything that you need to feed the, plant, the plants with. And I grew up with it. So I remember one day telling my mom, when I grow, I would want my home to be just as I'm seeing our home in Dansoman. By the time Alberta Ekusika Adu got married, she had already unconsciously set herself up for life. When I met my husband, we were courting, and I remember telling my mom, when I get my first pay, I'm going to give her money, get somebody to get me flower pot, to mold flower pot for me, which I did about 60 pieces. I was then caught in. I didn't even know whether this guy was going to marry me or even if by the grace of God he got married to me, whether I was going to be in a compound house, a single room. But because I so much love plant, I did 60 pots. So that's by the way. By the grace of God, we got married. And now me here, madam, I had a big compound where I fixed all the 60 pots. Strict as the word can be, Eku Sike's mom made sure that no friend of her daughter's visited them at home. But the uniqueness of the year 1983 in Ghana's history will change things a little for her. When there was shortage of food in the country, we were queuing for flour, for maize, for corn, for virtually everything. But as a young girl, old was I around 13 years and my mother was so strict we didn't have friends in fact nobody comes to the house so my mom had clothes from work around 4 p.m. this woman was coming home and there were so many people in front of our house lined up what was happening this young Ekusika 13 year old girl I don't know what came into me, but I think from the very tender age, it's been me and the Holy Spirit. I got a little, mommy brought shogun. Yeah, we had a little shogun, we had flour. I combined both, made some rock bands and scones, baked about 100 or so pieces, and I decided to sell because there was no food anywhere. So I placed this in front of the gate and people started coming. I was selling, I was selling, they were buying, I was happy, all smiling. Kids will come, parents will come, fathers, they were just buying. So when my mom got to the gate, she was like, what is happening here? You could tell from her face, she was angry, what is happening? But when she saw what I was doing, she was so happy. And I don't even know whether she carried me because she was like, hey, Ekusika, a bad nobel with him. When a normal Odamajuni, a radin shell, 
de ama enko fwedi ban ma wedi. Inya e yi wo baby ya. And I was so happy. I was so fulfilled because I was able to put food on the table. Unlike a foretaste of what her future would look like, Eku Sika grew up with a passion that birthed the idea of passion for mother and child. The Lord inspired me to gather teenage mothers, the privilege, feed them, give them a vocation. And I'm like, ah, na me sika hi na me wa me ba be she teenage mothers and all these things. But before then, I was doing that on my own. I would go to town and I see people, I feel the need to give them money or ask them, come home, I have order on such a such a day come help me and you get food to eat i was doing that until one day i was going to the the laundry i'd parked by the roadside crossed took the clothes to the laundry on my way home i was listening to um 88.7 so i came back sat in the car started the car and all I heard was, you don't need any confirmation. I am your confirmation. I looked and I was scared. So came out of the car, stood beside my car and was like, ah, what is this? For how long will you stand out? I went back into the car and then came home. It had to take more than a confirmation for her to know that this was indeed something God wanted her to do. In another time, I was home watching Ben Heen on telly. And a voice said, change the channel. Which I looked around, there was nobody. So I was now working under instruction. I changed the channel. It kept saying, change it. I kept changing till I got to Metro TV. It was around 11.30 or so AM. And I heard, I'm a Nyaneba, a young girl of 19, being abused, blah, 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 with a child. And the voice says, go for her. I'm like, go for who? This is TV. How will I even do that? Says, go for her. Call and tell them you are interested in the story. I said, yes, boss. But then how do I get the number of Metro TV? I called my son, he got me the number of Metro TV. Immediately I called, I was connected to the, um, is it the newsroom? And I told them I was interested in the story. They took my number and within a space of less than an hour or so, I saw myself on tele being interviewed. So we agreed in about three days time, they will take me to where the lady is, somewhere in Aboso, kind around Kaneshi. So we went and that was also a big news on Metro TV. With the help of a number of other professionals, Eku Sika got these young girls together and started training them in vocational skills. There was this voice that told me, drive to Teshi Nungwa, so I went out as I was on the greater estate. I took a left turn. Then I saw house for rent. I drove in there, spoke to the guys, and it was just a smooth deal. I took the place, started with a few girls I had, the one from Metro news and a few people and by word of mouth people who came to hear people who um saw what happened on metro tv started bringing people so i trained them in catering because i'm a caterer i got people who were fashion designers and hairdressers so we started at teshi first junction opposite the electoral um, commission for over seven years and after that I went to Gempa to do some NGO courses management courses so I could manage the NGO well it won't be like um, you are just doing it anyhow you have to 
manage things properly you have to do it and do it well so i went to gimpa did a few courses i've been there for three um three occasions NGO management i've forgotten the courses but i did all that which i have all the certificates there so that it won't be like um you've gathered girls and then giving them home training no not just home training there has to be a book knowledge as well you have to learn and learn well so that you know what you are doing learning advocacy and several of those things yes. when COVID 19 hit in 2020 like many businesses things with passion for mother and child also took a little dip but it was also another great breakthrough for her on the 14th of um, March 2020, there was a lockdown, so we we're not able to go to meet in our training center. I wasn't going anywhere, I was stuck at home. Then, like um, Steve Jobs once said in an interview or a speech given to one university, he said, You cannot connect things in the future but you can connect things from your past so I connected all these plans all the works I've been doing since I was home I was not going anywhere I now got time for my plans Now, let's call her the woman who talks to plants. With every research she did into plants, unconsciously, she was building a business so much that she sometimes forgets to eat while doing it. So I wake up early in the morning, do my house chores, then I come and sit in my garden, clean, prune, just like I was doing when I was seven years old. Then I will start talking to my plant. You are beautiful. I like the way you are. I like the colors. Oh, how can one plant have three colors? So I was just admiring nature. And the Lord started talking to me. This is an oxygen plant. It can do this for you. It can do that. So I got so much interested in it. And all my time was always in the garden. So I'll post, I'll take the picture, post on my status, some on my Facebook, do a research, talk about this. Maybe this is called Sansevera, another name, mother-in-law's tongue. Then I'll just go find out why mother-in-law's tongue. And one says, I beg you, anyone listening to me, they said, the mother-in-laws, omwano eye ya. Their mouths are sharp. Their tongues are sharp. So that is then I'm like, wow, this is funny. So I'll just get the name, the fan. This is ZZ. This is Red Beauty. You see, I started learning the names so I could post them on my status. People got interested. Then they ask, can I get something for my? hall can i get something for my bedroom which one do you think is okay for the bathroom for this and we kept going it got interesting so every day you see me here working at nurseries looking for new plants and i was so fulfilled that was my passion that was my heart because i can come here in the morning say eight o'clock I will be here till 6 p.m. My husband will have visitors and they are like, do you sell them? I said, yes. Can I have this one? I sell them. So I started going to the Volta region, buying pots and working with them. So. But there was more that her plant's garden was given that she never knew herself until this woman walked in one day. 
I went outside the gate to just admire the pot I've arranged outside. And this woman was coming, she was like, oh, madam, um, do you know the one selling this pot? I was like, it's me. Just oh, okay. I've been passing here every day. I want to stop, but because on the roadside, I'm scared of the trucks that are passing. And I'm like, you can come and park in my house. And he said, no, I've parked behind your house. So I walked her in because I have lots of pots in the house too. So she just looked through what we have in there and we came in. Immediately she entered, she was so happy and was like, wow, you have a beautiful home. Can I sit? I said, yes. She sat and I took th her through the plants. What is this? What is that? She was so happy. And she was like, who are you? What do you do? I'm like, um, mom, please, I don't understand. How do you mean? She said, when I was coming, I wasn't feeling well. I had this terrible headache and as I started I even wanted to ask if you could give me a paracetamol but just as you spoke with me the way you were so passionate about the plants and talking about them some, I felt something just leave me that's why I asked who are you I'm like I'm a praying woman and I believe in what I do so I prayed with this woman. She was so happy, started jumping. I'm healed, I'm healed. I'm like, God, I thank you. She took my number that she will call immediately she gets home. And that was the end of that woman. I didn't hear from her. There was no call and I've never seen her to date. Could that be an angel? Who came to tell me what you are doing is good, so continue on doing it. Another woman also shared her experience about how these plants did more than beautify her home. This lady, she's also a journalist. I don't want to mention her name. She called me one day and was like, Mommy, I, went, I took my little boy to the hospital and this doctor, an Indian, said, you need to put a plant in your son's bedroom by the side so he, he could inhale this oxygen. It's going to improve his health. Immediately, she remembered me and called me in front of the, the doctor. So truly, I made the beautiful pot of Sansevera. Another name for snake plant. It has nothing to do with snake. It's just the design. I have one over there. It's just the design in it, right? That is what looks like a snake, but it has nothing to do with snake. Because the little boy was just around four or five years, I put decorative pieces around it. And to the glory of God, the mother came back to give a testimony to the extent that it went to break their marriage. It's when to put their marriage together and I was happy. And then it was her husband and how he got healed from the effects of these same plants. I'm so happy here. I'm so happy and um, two, as a two years ago or so, COVID, my husband was attacked by the same COVID which landed him in ICU. It was such a terrible moment. People around him were dying. I lost my cousin, late Ejakon's wife, Auntie Nana. I'll say it's my cousin or my auntie. We lost Sister Nana. But by the grace of God, and I believe by what I do, because I know taking care of orphans, the needy, is the heartbeat of Christ. So if you are able to do such, God gives you long life and always sitting in nature, admiring and inhaling it. When my husband got back home from ICU, every morning, 5 a.m., he will come and sit in the garden, taking his tea, reading his book, having his meetings, 
all in the garden and he so much enjoyed it the breeze the air that will just be going up and down all around him just brought the healing speedily he really enjoyed it i must say it was what brought about his healing and i'm happy because i get most people mommy can i come around i feel terrible i have this issue in my marriage can i come around i want us to sit in the garden and then we talk about it i'm like yes come because i love to do that and charlie uh, the feedback i get is so fulfilling so that is what has brought us here today like everything in life her work with these young ladies has had its own share of challenges then somebody will ask so have you forgotten about the the teenage mothers no i had not forgotten about them we always met on we had a platform where we chat we do our devotions and everything on platform sometimes they, i invite them to come over we had a chat but one of my facilitators had a place so all the girls are there i visit them we talk we continue with the school we continue with all the advices so so far it's been good in passion for mother and child when the girls come there's no any follow-up no parent of theirs come to say hey mommy we are in teshi so they usually speak um um oh you are done we don't hear something things like that no 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 i've never but when you share the food and they take home then they will call oh for no you are done i said i said that in your media because my guy is not very good so you see the same way we connected the dot from the past what i did that is what now i'm feeding people and why does she talk to her plants? Ekusika tells us the story. So I continue on talking to the plants. I would come, talk to you, admire, and most especially when I work for any client, any client, sorry, and the person is going, or we are supposed to pack the things in the car. I go close to the plant and I talk to them. I tell them, as you are going, let there be peace in that home if there's any marital issue go and solve that issue because you are living and in the garden of eden was a peaceful place go and do same and the report i get from the client was so amazing and it kept me going it kept me going why the name eden garden I decided to name it Eden because it was fulfilling. I had so much fulfillment here, the passion, the joy. People will come and they give testimony. Ekusika tells us about some of the names of these plants and their significance. This is the snake plant with the botanical name Sansevera. Sansevera, right? So these ones it's good for your bathroom it's good for your living room it can go anywhere it serves all, all people have all these these are all fan this is monstera if you have this in your home why wouldn't you love nature why wouldn't your love for god increase He's a wonderful God. See the wonders of his hands. See holes in plants. It's so amazing. This is another kind of phobia. It's another kind of phobia. That is aloe vera it has several uses for the hair for 
says for bangs, for smoothing your face, you won't go wrong with aloe vera. Yeah. That's ready to be delivered in tea. I need help, please. So this is the final work. This is our final work. Mm. What a thing of beauty. Isn't it beautiful? So that is our red beauty. Living Eden Gardens to its final place. And like I always do, as they are leaving my hands and my home, I say a word of prayer. As you live here, mm. may the Lord go with you. May you bring peace in your new home. May you bring beauty and love, just as you are so colorful, so nice and natural. Every marriage in that home, let it be so. Go and glow as the leaves are glowing. Let there be peace. Let there be joy. Let there be be abundance of everything in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And that's how we bring a wrap to this week's edition of The Untold here on Ghana Web TV with our guest, Mrs. Alberta Ekusika Ado. Thank you once again for joining us. As always, remember, there's news for you when you log on to www.ghanaweb.com. And as always, be kind to one another. Another exciting edition of Talk Famous. This time around, we are coming live from the AICC Grand Arena. It's different, yeah, the steez is different and all of that, we know. And that's why we are happy to bring you this um, fresh fill. We are here with the very beautiful Sugar Titi. You look rubbish. Thank you so Please much. Please take a good look at her for me. Give us a turn. Give us a 360. Woo! Okay, so, um, I can see as always, you're not your bra. <laughs> What's the motivation behind that? Why? Um, my designer chose this outfit. She says, oh, she's house of A. Okay. <laughs> she says, I want to look this way today. I'm like, okay, I'm good. So is it the case that all your outfits are without bra? And what's the like motivation behind it? It's not all my outfits anyway. <laughs> okay. So um, what outfits would you pick to wear and then choose to wear a bra? There are some that I've worn with bra. Okay. Maybe you didn't realize. That. And there are few, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So is it that you want your boobs to let loose, to be free, or you just simply advertise for stuff? Oh uh, no, my designer actually decides. What to wear? I, don't, I don't actually tell her what I want. I'll tell her to create something for me and then. Okay. She wears. I know this is BGMs, but let's have a little chit chat. You just um, buried your dad. My condolences to you. How did it go? How did it happen? But oh, it all went on. Oh, it went well. Okay, so um, do you agree that you've been controversial? I'm a baby girl. <laughs> <laughs> but do you agree to that though? Because most people see you to be a controversial brand. Do you agree with that? Yeah, they, some people just don't understand me, and some people have accepted, some are yet to accept. So, but there have been changes. If I compare now to 20, 2018, oh, there's 
there will be much massive changes. Okay. Yeah. So the changes in what aspect? Positive. Okay. A lot of people are accepting that, okay, this is me. I just like to like, you know, wear what I want to wear, be myself nothing but like so what do you call yourself i'm a model i'm an actress and and a vixen maybe a video vixen does this word you use nudist yeah, i used to be i'm no more than this <laughs> okay. because now i wear at least i wear something i wear a bra and pants a bikini no, that's no the bikini is though do you advertise for um, brands or usually yeah. yeah i do advertise for brands okay so do you get um, backlash in your DMs, when oh, you I post used to. all those things online, I used to, but not anymore. I used to, but not anymore. Now but how better. about the men, and how how do you handle their attitudes in your DM? Oh no, now I'm used to them. I won't even lie. I'm so used to them. You're used to them, huh? Yeah. So they still come and offer you all sorts. Just to does it still stand? I mean, men are moved by what they see, mm. so they'll still come. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, I see you roll a lot with um, the likes of Ifia, Tracy, and Paul. What's your actual relationship with them? Oh, uh, Ifia is my godmother. Okay. Tracy is my big sister, so okay. that is it. Yeah. Okay. Did she tell you the actual reason why she wasn't present? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. She wasn't around, oh. and then Tracy wasn't also around. She she came the same day at the funeral, and the funeral wasn't in the crowd. Mas it was in B, so it's understandable she couldn't make. Okay, you posted a certain uh, video on your page and then you were like, people are saying you don't have a family. Yeah. People are saying you don't have a family. So, um, how did that happen and why did you choose to react to that? Oh, I realized that because of what I do, they think maybe I came from the sea. <laughs> from a sea. Or maybe I, I just came to exist because someone said I was mommy water. So I was like, okay, how? And the person was like, it's not like he has seen me outside before. You don't meet me at the mall. You don't meet me anywhere. I only post pictures. So if I'm human, that, how come I don't come out? Wow. Yeah. Uh, how did you react to that? Not at all. I was okay. I was 100% okay because <laughs> it is true. I barely go out. I hate going out. I go out when it's needed. Okay. Tell us about your social life. Um, are you dating? <laughs> I'm not dating. <laughs> Wow, that's really hard to believe. Um, I'm a lady, but I know that's really hard to believe. How? Why are you? Two, why aren't you dating? Uh, because I'm not dating. <laughs> why? Any reason? Because a pretty lady like you. Oh, thank oh you're not you. the type that likes talk. You don't like a label. You don't want to be held down by one person. <laughs> oh no, I am. But okay, okay I'm a dating. <laughs> 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 a known figure or someone who I don't like known people. Why? Oh no, I don't. But you roll with them a lot. Yes, but I can't date them. Why? Because no. you know what they do or <laughs> You know, oh, okay. I've, I've never liked any known person. No, I can't be with a known person. I want a reserved person. Yeah, someone who minds his business and just keep making money. Okay, what's your relationship with Moisha? I see you guys in a video clip, oh, and I see you rolling with him in the video clip. And then, um, I don't know, aside that you guys are, are cool, if I understand. So, how. You've heard of, you must have heard of her condition. Yeah. So, how do you feel about the entire thing? And what do you think um, should be done about it with regards to now she's all over social media posting and all of that? Do you think she should limit it? Or do you think that, what do you actually think about the entire situation? Oh no, I feel people will always talk regardless. So, she should just do what she wants to do. I mean, they will always talk. If you're quiet, she wasn't posting some time ago. And they were all complaining. Oh, it's not quiet. It's posting. Oh, it's not doing this, not doing that. So now that she's posted, yeah, yeah. But have you reached out to her? No, I haven't yet. Why? Wow. No, nothing personal. I just haven't. Okay. So take us through your journey. Sugar tea. tea. Yeah. All we saw when there was boom. Sugar tea was on social media. Where did she come from? So people will not know you came from <laughs> the sea. She's not from the sea. Actually, she's human. Oh no, so I tell was, us about yourself. I was born in the BA. Okay. Mim. Okay. And I was taken to Kumasi, taken to Takara, then back to Kumasi. Okay. Then I moved to Accra. Okay. And I decided to do something. So I went to learn makeup, it wasn't working. So I started doing shit for myself and I realized people liked what I was doing. So you chose to yeah. go that lane. Yeah. But then um last 
last, um, I think some time back, in an interview with Delay, you were speaking on the fact that you had a lot of daddy issues. Yeah. How is it now? Is it still the same? Do you suffer relapses from that? I didn't get the question. Is it daddy? Yeah, daddy issues. Oh no. How is that now? Oh, it's okay. That's at least okay. he's gone. <laughs> what do you mean by at least he's gone? <laughs> oh, no, like, it's not like he's dead. I would have to think that's okay. I have to go to my dad. I'm going to meet my stepmom. You see that kind of thing. So, but were least, you guys in good terms? No, we're not before he died. We we're not. Really? No, we we're not. How come? Did you try to make amends? Like it's a lot. I wouldn't want to go into details, but we were not. So, did his death hit you? Oh yeah, I was. I was really sad, especially when I saw his lifeless body laying there like that. Uh, what were some of the questions running through your mind? Like, is he really gone? He changed. He wasn't the man I knew. When I saw him, I was like, wow, so my daddy is gone. So how long since you saw him till the time that he died? Like six or seven years. Wow. Yeah. Why? Don't get issues with me because me, I stress issue. <laughs> For seven good years, and then one day you are called that your dad is dead. Never step on my toe. <laughs> How was your reaction? How did you feel? That must be really good. Honestly, painful. I was sad. I wouldn't even lie about that. And I was crying, and then, and then my friends took video, and people felt it was fake. I didn't react to that very one yeah. because. I knew how sad I was, you understand? When I saw his lifeless body, oh no, it was bad. Like, I wanted to talk to him, but he looked like a different person. He wasn't a daddy I knew because I learned he was sick before he died, so he changed. Rumors were flying out there that your dad is a wealthy man and all of that. People are actually arguing. Sugar Titi, okay, so the Sugar Titi you guys were seeing it so on social media, thinking she, she has nobody, she's a loner and all of that. Her dad is actually a wealthy man. How true is that? He was okay. <laughs> <laughs> they said he owns so so and so and so. They were actually mentioning a lot of properties. Oh, he was okay. Okay. He was okay. So, do you see yourself trying to inherit any of this? Or you wouldn't dare go that tangent? Yeah, I'm, the, I'm the first child, I mean, so if it comes fine, but I wouldn't go for it. What's your relationship with your stepmom? Your father's wife? So, I mean, I don't want to talk about that one. So, how. how well, how was the funeral thing? If there was no communication, you did your own thing and she also did her own thing. We were like, cool, everyone is cool. I just being in your zone and being my zone. Everybody is trying to mind their business. Everyone is trying to behave like a civil person. So we're okay. What has your dad's death taught you? What's that one lesson that you have learned? To reconcile with anyone you're not in good terms with, regardless the reason, honestly. Because I really wanted to talk to him. You know, the thing is, my dad was the one motivating me, you understand? When I was being sacked from the house, I wanted to make it and make him feel like, with or without you, I made it. Yeah. You understand? Yeah, that was the whole thing. And has that reflected in your life, in your attitude, your character anyway? Do you think that going forward, um, it's going to make me sober? My father's death is going to make me sober? I'm going to limit some of the things I do? Have you made such decisions? I will. <laughs> then is. I'll do everything at the right time, you understand? So if I feel like, okay, I want to do this thing now, I'll just stop and do it. If I feel like, okay, I have to still continue with what I'm doing. Do you have plans of getting married? Yeah, I believe in marriage. Marriage is a beautiful thing. Now you're having kids and settling down. Yeah, uh, like one. <laughs> one? Yeah. You don't spoil your beautiful body. Oh, not because of that. I'm scared of childbirth. Wow. Oh. I think you should brace yourself for it. Because <laughs> every woman is going to go there one day. Or you don't. I pray I meet a man who would understand that we have a surrogate. <laughs> wow. Why would you take the pain to do that though? I don't know. Because I'm scared of child, but it's not even because of my body. It's not because of my body or anything, but a lot of women lose their lives. Like, it's scary. You're scared. Yeah. Okay. Um, speaking of your body, you've heard rumors that you've done liposuction. Okay. No, I haven't done You anything. haven't? No, I haven't. Are you sure? No, I haven't. Look at your waist. Uh-huh. You can train, you get waist training and then go to You're the gym. lying. I'm not lying. You celebrities, you really, really <laughs> lie to us. How? Yes, a lot. No. No, I don't like what you're doing. No. You see a celebrity with a big tummy who sells flat tummy too. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
so unfair though. That's so unfair. But okay, well, anyways, I'll believe you if you say you haven't no, done No, I haven't, it. my love. I haven't. So we should train? Yeah, train. For how long? But it should, training should be a lifestyle. It shouldn't be like, okay, I'm training for this month. You will get it. When you stop, it will come back. That's the whole thing. If you have a busy lifestyle in country, you have to adjust. In so a way. What, what's your thoughts on like section? People, it's not everybody that can train. People want, want permanent results. No, so if you want, if you want it and you have the money, go for it. I mean, why? Go for so it. So you don't frown on it? No, no, no. Why? Okay. It's your life, it's your decision. Okay, all right. It's been fun having you on Talk Assignment here on Ghana Web TV. This is, this has been um, the beautiful Sugar Titi. She said quite a number of interesting things, and I can't wait for you to see it. This is Talk Assignment on live on Ghana Web TV, and this is Amara coming from the Grand Arena inside the AICC. We hope to come your way sometime soon. So stay blessed. I mean, anyone who passed East Legon has been seeing this hotel. It's called the Men's Big Hotel. And I'm here to explore this place. So this place is known for its big and spacious conference room. And I'm currently here to spend the night. In fact, have a staycation here with my friend. And so of course, you know, I can't go to a hotel without taking you along. So come, let's go. Let's explore this place. Let's go, guys. interested to see how the room looks like right come come let's go so this is the washroom yeah come let me show you so the room is so spacious the room is really really spacious and the room is colorful the room is beautiful the furniture has like a vintage touch so if you're an art lover you really love this room because um, at any point like there's beautiful art facing me, behind me, in front of me and it's so beautiful. Like look at this painting like this. That is nice. And yeah, I came with my friend. My friend had flowers this morning. Oh, how cute. She's such a lover girl. <laughs> and this is going to be my room. I came last night and I had fried rice and chicken. It was so good and I woke up to this beautiful view. Let me show you my view from here. Meet my friend. Hi, Millie. Hi. <laughs> Do you all remember her from my Code Evolve videos? Do they yeah, remember you? <laughs> so I'm, a, yeah. I'm a popular guest. Yeah, she's, she's very popular on my channel. Let me know your favorite um, part of the room. Is it this painting? Is it the bed? Or the washroom or this painting. It comes with a TV, a fridge. So this is the fridge. So you get a good welcome when you come here. And the place is really nice, very colorful. I think this is a perfect place for maybe when you have like um, a wedding dress up, you can come and dress up because it's really big, really spacious. You can have like maybe your bride and your bridesmaids here or your groomsmen here. It's such a, a, a big space. You can tell from the video. Look at this. And I like the fact that it's in the middle of town. So whilst you're here, you can see um, Legon, you can see Villajo, you can see like the Accra Township. guys yesterday i made a new friend and she happens to be the manager hi belinda hi stella <laughs> good to I, see you 
same here. Actually, I'm not the manager. I'm actually the reservations manager. Oh, oh she's still there. the manager. She's still the manager. <laughs> so, what's special about this place? Tell me. Well, I'll say that it's our conference room that makes us very special. Okay. Because we have a lot of conference rooms. Mm. About eight of them. Wow, that's a yeah. lot. And the largest sits up to 700. So, we have quite a number. And then I'll say that we have more conference rooms than our competitors around here. Okay. Yeah, because we are mainly into conferencing. So most of the time, we host a whole lot of conference here. Mm -hmm. Also, our rooms, we have the largest room. Most of our rooms are very, very spacious. spacious yeah. Yes. The room I had was just like, it's really, really, yeah, really yeah, and I very know. colorful. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the, the rooms are like that big space, and guests really enjoy coming there because of the space. Yeah. And then the vintage touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The wood, the yes, wood, the, the wood, wood, yeah. So you see, that really makes people come here often. And our friendly staff, we are always ready to welcome you. Even if you stay out there for a long time and you come, we are still able to make you out. So it's like home away from home when you visit here. So. Okay. So, since I have met the manager, I'm going to get an extra night for free, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> So, so guys, you heard it from her. I mean, let's explore the place. I hope you're enjoying watching this vlog as much as I'm enjoying my time here at the Men's Big Hotel. But I realize there's an annex. Yeah, we used to operate, but now we are not operating it anymore. Okay, so, so guys, let's continue enjoying the view from the Men's Big Hotel. Wow, they really have big halls. Like, yes. wow, I think, I, think, I think it's really known for like um, conferences. So if you are a company, you want to have your conference here, you don't have to sleep here to rent their spaces. can see Villaggio from here and you can see Legon from here and yeah this is a beautiful pool She's also ready. <laughs> we are going to swim. You all know me. I can't go somewhere with a pool and decide not to swim. It's not possible. The only thing is today I don't want to get my hair wet, so I have here something to cover my hair. And yeah, so let's go and swim. We are currently in the rainy season, so you can't be assured of a good weather every day. But thank God, at least today the sun is out a little. <laughs> yeah, so we are going to swim. Banku and tilapia as always and she's having jollof, jollof rice tilapia. <laughs> so yeah all invited let me taste their banku for the first time it's nice the shito is really good let's try their tilapia 
Mm -hmm. I highly recommend their tilapia. I had um, chicken yesterday and it was good. Second meal of the day, apart from the breakfast I had, is tilapia and also good, very spicy. If you don't want spice, you can just order. Hmm. So I'm currently here at the gym and I'm the only one here. Yes, yeah, so this is my outfit check. night was my last night here today is sunday sunday morning and this is going to be my last morning here i just quickly had to just dress up change to this outfit go have breakfast and leave here i have my church outfit here so i mean it's sunday and once i'm in accra i have to make it to church so from here i'm going straight to church i wanted to show you how beautiful i look and share my experience here at the men's week hotel i think the place is really big it's a very big space and um, the staff are really friendly all the staff i've um, come in contact with are like oh oh like oh this oh that's like i've even made friends <laughs> while well, here the breakfast was good i had lunch i had banku as always <laughs> banku and tilapia last, last um like yesterday then and you know the lunch was so heavy that i forgot to even order for break uh, for dinner so i didn't have dinner last night that's why i'm so hungry this morning so i'm going to have breakfast for the last time and yeah so this has been my experience here i encourage anyone if you're in accra and you want a place to stay come to the men's big hotel i had a good time here and it's in a prime area at east legon it's very close to the airport it's about 10 minutes drive from the airport you can see villaggio from here you can see legon from here it's like in the middle of the city so you don't have a problem when it comes to the location so let's go um i saw the back here so yeah let's go let's go have breakfast and yeah i'm going to say bye bye to this room the bed is messy but i really like the painting here here is so colorful when you look here something beautiful when you look at the other side another painting which is so beautiful so let's go have some breakfast um three new friends while having breakfast and yeah i have three new subscribers so if you're watching this shout out to you <laughs> yeah so yeah let's go yeah i hope you enjoyed watching this vlog as much as i enjoyed being here as much as i enjoyed documenting my entire experience at the men's big hotel until next time on my next video <laughs> i want to say i love you all I just left is legon i'm going to church catch you guys on another day another video as always thanks for the support and everything i love you all Fiscal discipline really is the ability of government to balance revenues and expenditures. And when discipline is not maintained, um, expenditures inevitably exceed revenues and that creates a deficit. Um, following where we are, um, government 
has focused in the 2022 budget on fiscal consolidation to enhance debt and fiscal sustainability as we implement our economic revitalization and transformation program. The measures that have been implemented in the 2022 budget include validation and revenue enhanced measures to reposition our economy. Indeed, the implementation of the measures highlighted in the 2022 budget should lead to a significant fiscal adjustment from a projected deficit of 12.1% of GDP in 2021 to 7.4% of GDP in 2022. And this represents a 4.7 percentage point adjustment, a downward adjustment in the deficit in one year. In, in one year. In January 2022, government announced and began implementing a 20% expenditure cut as part of the fiscal stabilization and debt sustainability measures through the Minister for Finance. And this was followed by an additional 10% cut in discretionary expenditure, all in att an attempt to balance the fiscal position and restore fiscal discipline following the banking crisis, the COVID, the Ukraine and Russia war and so on. In addition, the Ministry of Finance has strengthened expenditure monitoring systems and processes to ensure effective implementation of these measures. For instance, government called for efficient use of energy resources and in line with this, fuel coupon allocations to all political appointees and heads of government institutions, including SOEs, were cut by 50% effective 1st April this year. To cut waste in the compensation budget, government is also working with the internal audit agency to eliminate ghost workers from the government payroll. To this, all public institutions have been directed to submit headcount copies of their monthly salary validation reports to the Internal Audit Agency and Controller and Accounting General's Department by the 15th of every month for validation. The Internal Audit Agency will in turn follow up on these reports to authenticate and check the existence of the staff and connect their productivity to remuneration being paid by government. By this, ladies and gentlemen, government is taking steps to save a lot of money from ghost names, and I'll come back to this in a bit, and to pursue those who do not work but get paid. These and other strategic measures adopted by government are to ensure fiscal discipline in our financial systems and anchor economic sustainability. Macroeconomic development in the first seven months of 2022. Ghana's economic situation has deteriorated rapidly in the first seven months of the year. Over the period, the macroeconomy has become highly unstable, with all the key indicators worsening at rapid rates. Consequently, the execution of the 2022 budget has not gone as to plan, with fiscal position in the first half of the year turning out worse than the government initially projected. First, the relative price stability the country has enjoyed in the past few years has disappeared. As year-on-year -year consumer price inflation rate, which averaged, for instance, 9.9% and 10.0% in 2020 and 2021, respectively, stood at 13.9% in January 2022. The inflation rate increased to 19.4% in March and further to as high as 
31.7% in July 2022. Indeed, the July rate is the highest rate of inflation recorded in Ghana since November 2003. That's a period of more than 18 years. Partly driving the surge in inflation is a sharp depreciation of the exchange rate since the beginning of 2022. From January to the end of July 2022, the interbank exchange rate of the city against the US dollar depreciated by 21.1% compared with a depreciation rate of only 0.7% in the same period in 2021. The Forest Bureau exchange rate of the city against the US, dollars, US dollar depreciated by as high as 27.3% from the beginning of January to the end of July 2022. Interest rates have also increased sharply, reflecting the soaring inflation and tightening of monetary policy by the central bank. Both the 91 and 182-day Treasury bill rates, the principal indicators of government short-term borrowing costs, have more than doubled in the first seven months of the year, rising from 12.51% and 13.19% to 26.34% and 28.06% respectively. Similarly, the daily interbank interest rate jumped from 12.7% to 21.87% in the period, while the average commercial bank lending rate rose from 20.04% to 24.7% from January to June uh, this year. So you are, can all appreciate the rate of deterioration in macroeconomic stability. social intervention programs and policy initiatives with the goal of helping to reduce government spending. It is important for the government to reduce budgetless pressures arising from the various social intervention programs and policy initiatives, such as free SHS, Agenda 111, U Star, Ghana Cares, and so on and so forth, by scaling down some of them and eliminating those that can be eliminated through a comprehensive review. Such bold policy changes will enhance the government's fiscal consolidation efforts and help to lift Ghana out of its present crushing fiscal situation, which is driving the macroeconomic instability. <laughs> In U.S., the word last dance, whenever it comes to mind, people think about Michael Jordan in 1997-98. But Asamojan wants a last dance with the Black Stars in Qatar 2022, citing an example of Roger Miller and Cameroon in 1994. Christian Atu has come out to support the former Black Stars captain that Otuado and the Ghana Football Association should grant the request of the legend to be part of the team in Qatar. What do you think about this request of Asamojan? Let me hear from you on this episode of the Ghana World Sports Debate right here on Ghana World TV. But follow me as I get interesting answers to this request on the streets of Accra at Kwame Nkrumah Circle. My name is Joel Leshen and this is another episode of the Ghana World Sports Debate right here on Ghana World TV. Samojan is not ready to hang his boot. He wants to be part of the squad who will make their trip to Qatar 2022. 
Should the Samojan be added to the squad or not? Already, Christian Atu is out giving his support to his former captain that he should be added to the squad. In his own words, give him his last wish. As Samojan, I'm fine and cool. What happened to me? Oh, it's my I'm fine and cool. On board, board for about two years. I'm a black stars. Oh, and yeah, no cray. But to see, I saw an agent so be called yeah. Me now he training. So I just say, for football, yeah, you can maybe play football without training. So I just say, so training air hard so be quiet. For see, I'm fine. Maybe I'm quiet on the pitch. I'm quiet. So I just say, maybe some technical support be quiet now. But him the match team. Because maybe say Argentina for Aguero any more call. Because any of them say recently now. But but say Aguero no. Aguero is not going as a footballer, he's going as a backroom staff. But as a Samojan, they also are training for the past one or two months. Also, are training, he will be in good shape to make their trip to Qatar. And tell me, like I said, young fan in Qatar. Six man squad in Hong Kong. And I miss me, Chow say, as Moja and Kona or Kon, it's not about only on the page to talk about Bong Kwong. You may see a Yano on technical support, so I just said, you could do a beer off the page, you know, you be Yano in support, Ama and Kwana when you go, Obi say, Afanajan, or a young, Dodd Nequa, or a only experience in Bia or Black Stars in him, so I just Antoine Summer or Abano, only experience in Bia. Where Jordan and you now? You ain't me rely on Jordan and you, Kwan, because recently the match is now all born. You won't be beer also. There are things that I said more than you. I don't know why. I don't know why. As a team, no. So I just, and a technical team, now, because I'm saying, I best not have a bomb. So I think there are some other than you. So you're ready, Kwan, there. I see I'm playing a team, no, no, no. Because you're a team, you're an experienced player, so I think. Because we're a team, you're a team, you're a team. We have 2010 team now. You come out with cap now. You see any player be a woman this year? What is that, Samojan? Yeah. And we have Samojan records. Oh, what cap so? Wow, we need media dancers. Experience no ho. But we then up wiring. So I just we have the last one. We need to acquire one cool team now. You need to make a decision. You need Tunisia. So I just say, there is Samojan there. By who call group? I see a different team no ho. So and I'm going to say to all of them back home. All right, so it's a yes for him. As Samoyan should be added to the squad for 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar, November. What do you think? Let me hear from you in the comment section. So the question today is simple: yes or no. You can provide explanations. As Samoyan wants to uh, do the last dance with the Black Stars in Qatar, should we accept him or invite him to be part of the squad or not? Uh, Mini Unia di Kayakasa or say Yan Fan Samojan and Kao if we say a modern wa afene jan any Jordan Muya or national team yet. A Samojan bet you may be bring Yan Fan and Kao. Oh David David David. Am I a fan and count? Am I a fan and count? I didn't see Ghana your Africa's all time top scorer, a walk up, or say Siciano or your training saw the Kobe. Or say am I a fan and co. Oh Samojano when you and I your walk good players or high. Omo ba ah omo si su omo ba den omo be chimia bo far better than um asamoyan ba yung huni enti a Ghana hansi no um yung nimi se omo yung niska omo se den omo omo far that players ni yaden omo ba yung good and and quality players omo omo be chimia den abo more than asamoyan kwa eh enti asamoyan ni de asamoyan why why no kwa no why far enti tam yano ba ba so se oye training oh oye training se we nyesku chimia yaden yeye kobo eno yaden Wah, kau nunu mah fasi dulu biar mana ada aku fasi saya, aku ada. Aku nunu mah mah fasi nampak aku bobo dah bi. Tesis kalau tu mereka kau nanti ini ada, ya wosu wosu. Entah sama aja ada, ada yang sedang aku on on travel cuma, na yang fa good players ni ada, yang kau melayan, yang kau travel musuh yang musa ni, almost west train ada, eti. Alright, so it's a no for him. Uh, we will try and then we we will speak to uh, other Ghanaians about this uh, particular issue. It's a Samojan in the news. After speaking to the BBC, the Africa all-time top scorer at the FIFA World Cup says he wants to do a last dance with the Black Stars. Boss, we must go back Ghana Web TV. So a Samojan say World Cup on Opeso Kobi. He am fan of Kobi and I say he am can't change. He say the way he na ye on Tinafi. Boss, we must fan of Kobi. Then for Samojan. I didn't see the officer there, so I'm going to go. Also, I'm going to be a player, I'm going to be a player. I'm going to be a player, I'm going to be a player. Ghana. 
Uh, so uh, it's two against one. Uh, let, let me come here. It's two against one. It's getting heated. Uh, you can see what's going on here. Uh, Asamwajan wants to be part of the Black Stars for Qatar 2022. But I will go and speak to uh, all of them. But I have my two guests here. Uh, Bosu, Asamwajan, and then some of the two guys are BBC in the same. Washasa or your training. Or per se, on your last dance with the Black Stars in Qatar. Your friend will call Walker up and ask my friend. In any day, there are some Wajan or say Fanico. I said, there are some Wajan. Yes, if it's a Ghana, and you're about age, you know. As a Wajan, only on you since the Latin, if I'm over here. Ghana, your pair, only a Usa, never have it in any day, yes, a Wajan. Yeah, Afanijan, we are not as a Wajan, or when you saw experience. I'm going to say the enemy, but me experience one part and another one way, no better difference. I'm right. Yeah, none of the day, yes, a Wajan. Yeah, yeah, but a people can say, yeah, the Inaki Williams are bad as a Wajan or Berry. William Obere, who won in Lucky Williams? Oh, I top player, I said, in Abaso, on fire and co-work. I feel no no super, ye ni muno. But there's a mobile ya obo muno. Imagine, ye wo kamavinga wo marido, ne wo kamodridge mo. But in any day, kamavinga no ni mbono bo, but ye be bencho. Ye be bono kamodridge jao, because of experience. Ye ni asa majan, ye ni agos. All right, so we need goals. That is why we need a Samoyan in Qatar uh, 2022. What do you also think? Is it time that we give him the last opportunity with the Black Stars or not? Let me hear from you in the comment section. And uh, a Samoyan, any BBC, a Kodi Komo, and I will tell myself for the past two months, why you train here? So I crowd is a last dance. Young fan in call air Qatar walk up. When in the air train, and I say, this is a Christian too. And so, I did a better Samoyan, and she said. Young young boys neighbor. When I was a party for future, he So as I say, and yes, you be able to see a day. I was a building team in the Sun Kalan Kalan, so I'm mobile. I said, Well, fine, I'll be any day where we. But say, you're a as a technical team, you're waiting in the moment to be in the Naka, or could be as a food, you there, talk about the other day. We know, 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 we I said, we are going to be a good one. 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 We are going to be a uh, this man too. Uh, as a more jam, young fan in call walk up now. I say, you're man in traffic. You need to meet the man in traffic. man in traffic. I didn't because 1994, uh, Rojamela, no way, Jai Bobo, and so indomitable lions. So, air corner, you had no coy, and I didn't see a black stars. And so, young fan, some more jam. Need to meet the man in traffic. Because you say, me, Nimty Mobo. When I make a football, I'm about to be a fit. Okay. He okay. said, We need to move. Okay. You're about to call the uncle Jaomo. Don't come on my advice. The uncle has a technical team member. Sir. But say, uh, 26 man squad in a day. Yeah, we are going to be in the same way. We are going to be in the same way. We are going to be in the same way. We are going to be in the same way. We are going to be in the same way. We are going to be in the same way. We are going to be in the same way. Especially Nika Williams. I am a La Liga. Okay. Very good. Okay. The money chance that that champion boy. Inaki Williams will do the job for Ghana in Qatar 2022. So if Asamoja wants to be part of the trip, he should be part as a member of the technical team, not as a player. So far, it seems that uh, the, the street is supporting Baby Jet Asamoja in his request to be part of the 2022 FIFA World Cup squad. Uh, Mami Faumbrim, and uh, sorry, uh, in the BBC for the interviewer, Omani Asamoja and Abba Bontia, Jan Echose, was a training as a person. 2022 World Cup no Okobi. If you say you do Jamila, Eko, Ewo 1994, they say Ghana so yes, I'm a no. Eh, I'm a so Okobi. Eh, because as a modern, Oyo Oyo play bia like Oni Oni Boma, Emuye slow, slow, seriously. 
Sadia Samoja no nya dibia keke o. Ana impo maame fo ambro afo kokra fo. Sagana bobo na so ba Samoja edua. Obi anyo do betena TV hu hebi. Se ko fa Samoja nti. O do ama team no na e want to want to be ne nyamanya ma bi nti. Ana ma ne de abufu e de. Every time e ja bobo. Basa wa basa o e train so be ko bia. O deserve so ko bi. Eh san ko fa ye nti. Eni nti eni nti Say there are some more than a young it's a bit my man, a simple crowd, bit my man. Gone all the sun, I won't say, I'm so a jibber body, but sun all the other man gonna football. Fatter than Yama as a moja embra, no more bony. All right, so we should give us a moja the opportunity to do a last dance with the black star. Boss, my phone, so brave. As a moja, you're finding co work up now, and I said, My empathy. Me to me, the and Casamaja no more fan on call. No more fan on call because Samaja will play a bit in a game. Well, if you support from outside this thing from Pono to me, win win to me back. Support to me, ma, we crowd to me here. Then who to me share opponent for near with Yamanama and I support in a Samaja and war in Ghana Blast Tamuno. Za mkrofobi mkrampu wa mwa na mwamu sunti na asa asamaja ndebu fwe free mkrampu wano Mwamu nisa support no and farmer blaster Niti asamaja free blaster mwano niti na asa game nwa ye blaster na baye slow Niti asamaja ni hiyano bag bio Ok, niti isi ya blaster asa mwe striker ya wo ya wo Antoine Semenyo Ya wo Jordan Ayu Ya wo ya Inaki Williams Sa striker ene afene jan that's a big ask for uh, from this gentleman that if a Samojan is ready to go to Qatar, then Otuado should drop Jordan Ayu. Who is playing week in week out for Crystal Palace uh, and then also Asamoja in Qatar? It's getting interesting here on the streets of Accra. Let me hear from you in the comment section. Should we add Asamoja to the squad or we should tell him that he has already done enough? He should allow the young men to also take over from him. We are still asking Ghanaians about the request of Baby Jet Asamoja. He's Africa's all time top scorer at the FIFA World Cup. Uh, today, he made a request that he wants to be part of the squad in Qatar. We are finding out from Ghanaians whether uh, we should grant him his request or not. Uh, good morning. Thanks for joining us here on Ghana Web TV. Uh, Asamoja wants to be part of the squad in Qatar. Should we add him or not? Uh, good afternoon to you and good afternoon to our cherished listeners and viewers. Uh, my opinion differs from others. Okay. We have to look at his outputs. Okay. Uh, to our, if you look at Ghana, yes. for that matter, GFA or Ghana Black Stars, yes. our players retire early, okay. and which he Samojan is not an exceptional. Okay. If you look at his performance in the country yeah. if you ask me it is not encouraging yeah but uh, in, if, in if, the if, interview if, no, if, okay. if, if say he is going there just to boost morale of the other junior team members are then I have no issue yeah. but if he's going there for us to get any kind of output and I say one ball ball you understand yeah. I don't see him going to create any magic okay. in that team but he, he, he can go there as somebody who can trigger the players, who can motivate them. As a member of the technical team. team. That one has okay. no problem. But, but not, as, not as a player. Yeah. Your brother said that uh, he is in between. He should be. Uh, he, he, he should make the trip to Qatar, but not as a player, but as a member of a uh, technical team or management committee. Uh, what's your opinion on this issue? Good afternoon all. Yeah. My opinion is that for Asamoah Jan, he has now made his time. 
he made his time because I'm looking at him for now that his energy is not like the young boy, young boys was now. As he said, I'll support what, the, what he said that he can go and give them morale for that one I support him. For the field year, he should reserve for that one for the young, young boys, young, young boys. to come in. All right, so uh, you heard from them. Let me hear from you in a comment section as far as this conversation is concerned. So the big ask on this episode of the sports debate is the request of Baby Jet Asamojan ahead of the 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar. Don't forget that Jan is Africa's all-time top scorer at the World Cup and he wants a last dance with the team in Qatar. We are here asking the Ghanaians whether Asamojan should be added to the squad or not. We've already spoken to so many people but so far the consensus is that Jan should be added to the squad. I have my last guest here on the show. Uh, boss from Mokwaba, Eba Ghana Web TV so Eddie yeah. Kaino, Asamojan or say, uh, or your training at the no home or a good shape. You are finding a work up squad in the home. What are you doing? Me, first of all, for him, even put that quest, uh, that thing outside there, doesn't make sense to me uh, because on, on, on what merit, on, right? on, on the merit that yes. in 1994, uh, the indom indomitable lions of Cameroon, on um, mobile call uh, 94 work up, um, no, no, Jamila retire. Then so by virtue of uh, Roger Miller, a more top scorer, no. I'm not even back at him no more. And to say Ghana for, I'm only a salmon and salmon will retire. Masa, Masa, for me my own point doesn't make sense. For you adding some more down to the squad, it's like uh, why you so keen? Say we're not the what the Arian, I don't a boom. But a bit a bit set team no. What I say, as a more team, even though for me as a more than I prefer even so much more than some more than. But so much more you can see in that where uh, say. I, at least, I bought also folk, okay. right? This is a person who can't go to the I'll put it. I said, why even even uh, five meters going to me to me camp. What I say, and if for you put us a mud inside the squad, you know, I said, why are you soaking? Say, we now they are riding a boom. I finished my case. So he said that adding a Samoa Jan to the 26th man squad in Qatar will be like preparing a mixture of Gary sugar and then uh, water and adding sand to it. It's going to spoil everything. And to him, uh, he will argue for the inclusion of Sule Ali Muntari in the Black Stars than a Samoa Jan because of what he saw in last season's Ghana Premier League. Let me also hear from you in the comment section concerning a Samoa Jan's last request uh, before he retires from the game. My name is Joel Lechan and this this has been another episode of the Ghana World Sports Debate right here on Ghana Web TV. Do enjoy the rest of our programs and don't forget to subscribe to Ghana Web TV on YouTube. Review all the social intervention programs and policy initiatives with the goal of helping to reduce government spending. It is important for the government to reduce budgetless pressures arising from the various social intervention programs and policy initiatives, such as free SHS, Agenda 111, you start Ghana case, and so on and so forth, by scaling down some of them and eliminating those that can be eliminated through a comprehensive review. Such bold policy changes will enhance the government's fiscal consolidation efforts and help to lift Ghana out of its present crushing fiscal situation, which is driving the macroeconomic instability. <music>
The program provides opportunity to ministers, programs, and projects, as well as clarify issues of their respective institutions. This morning, I'm happy to announce that we have the Ahaf original minister and his delegation with us. The focus of today's presentation is about governance, health, and education, and for us to get the opportunity to receive first-hand information as to developments in the region. As mentioned earlier, this is a new set of programs we've designed for the regional coordinating councils so that they will be offered the opportunity to explain to the nation what is actually happening on the ground so far as their regions are concerned firsthand. And this first edition, we are receiving the Honorable Regional Minister for Ahafo Region. But before I yield the podium to the Honorable Minister, permit me to acknowledge District Honorable Frank Adusipoku, Honorable, if you are here, would like to acknowledge you. We also have the DCE for Asutifi North District, Honorable Anthony Mensa, with us. We have the Municipal Chief Executive of Nkranza South, Honorable Oredu Daniel. With us is the Deputy Director of Ahafo Regional Coordinating Council, Mr. Fritz Mensa. We also have the Regional Coordinating Director of Ahafo Region, Mr. Kwating Amwako Samson. With us also is Honorable Yao Owusu Brimpon, the CEO of Venture Capital. We also have the Buno East Regional Minister, Honorable Adujan, and his spouse, who we are honored to receive this morning. And as I mentioned earlier, we have the Ahafo Regional Minister, Honorable George Boache, with us this morning. So I will now yield the podium to the Honorable Minister to give us his remarks, and then we will come to you, ladies and gentlemen, for your questions. Thank you. Honorable Ministers of State, distinguished invited guests, distinguished members of the media, it gladdens my heart to be here this morning. As you have already been made aware, this is the first of its kind for the Regional Coordinating Council. And uh, I'm glad that AHAFO is now serving as the John the Baptist for this program. And uh, I'm sure at the end of it all, members of the media will also get to know what is happening in AHAFO. So far as governance, health, and education is concerned. So at this juncture, uh, I'll take you through. I want to read it from here. Honorable Ministers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have structured my uh, briefing in this way. After brief remarks, and then I have outlined the projects that I have for each of the sectors, it will be followed by a pictorial evidence of the projects I will be talking about. Thank you for this unique opportunity to share with you the good experience of the Ahafu region under the MPP led government led by President Nana Adodankwa Akufuado since he assumed the management of the affairs of the country in 2017. On behalf of the chiefs and people of the Hafu region, the Regional Coordinating Council, and on my own behalf, I wish to express our heartfelt gratitude and deepest sense of appreciation to His Excellency the President of the Republic, Nana Adudankwa Akufuado, for the initiation of this platform through the Ministry to share with the region and the nation what we have been able to do with the mandate they overwhelmingly handed to us in 2017 and graciously renewed in 2020. In my opinion, this marks a high point for us 
to tell our success story to the good people of this promising region in particular and the nation at large. And it is incumbent on us to make good our social contract with the people in pursuit of transparency, which reflects the hallmark of the NPP as a government and a political party. Let me express the sincerest gratitude of the Regional Coordinating Council and, of course, the chiefs and people of the region to the government and the Ministry of Information for giving the Afro region the opportunity to participate in this minister's press briefing initiative. Most importantly, we are very happy that the Afro region is the first region to take a step to set the pace in the minister's press briefing for this year and are very grateful to all associated with the organization of this important event. It is gratifying to note that within a period of half and half years of the administration of the NPP, the Af region has witnessed significant achievements which have positively impacted on the lives of our people, thereby consolidating the vision of His Excellency, the President of the Republic. In particular, the government flagship programs in agriculture, rules, trade and industry, rural, peri-urban and urban electrification, affordable housing, provision of logistics for security services, water and sanitation, employment creation are working well and gaining momentum. However, due to time constraints, the presentation will cover only three major areas that the Half region has been impacted. They include A, governance, B, health, and education. The Half region is one of the six administrative regions created on the 13th of February 2019 by Constitutional Instrument CI-114 and has got so as its capital. The region currently has a total population of 564,668, made up of 285,340 mills and 279,328 females, according to the 2021 population and housing census. Our region has a total land size of 5,193 kilometers squared and is bordered on the north and west by the Burun region, the north and east by Ashanti, and south by the western north region. Administratively, the region is made up of six assemblies, comprising three municipal assemblies and three district assemblies. Politically, the region has six constituencies, made up of 799 polling stations. Traditionally, the region has a total of 13 parliaments and four divisional uh, councils. The Afro region is inhabited mainly by the halfos of the Akan stock. There are, however, man minority groups like Kusansis, Dagumbes, Mamprusis, Krobos, and Gan Adangwis. You will recall that during the period of the campaign to secure sufficient boosts to justify the creation of the region, it was promised that the new regions will benefit from significant projects that will form the bedrock of development. The regions were also created to bring co governance closer to the people and give them a new experience with leadership. Currently, all the departments, institutions, and agencies are established and fully functional in the region. Therefore, citizens no longer have to travel long distances to Sunyane and other places to assess simple everyday services as hitherto was the case. I'm very glad and proud to say that they have for experience its reflection indeed. The government has since the creation of the Half region embarked on a number of infrastructure initiatives to boost governance and improve administration of the region. These include ongoing work on the main regional coordinating council administration block, Igoso, which is at an advanced stage of completion. A three number residential accommodation for senior staff of the regional coordinating council at Gosso, which is completed and currently being inhabited. 
Ongoing construction of regional health uh, directed and office complex at Huidim, which is about 55% complete. Two number residential accommodation for health director and staff at Huidim, which has since been completed and handed over. Regional education directed and office complex and two number residential accommodation at Bichim have been completed and handed over to the regional education directorate. Ongoing works of the regional federal rules office complex and two number residential accommodation at Kukum, which is about 85% complete. Ongoing work of the regional agri office complex, which is about 95% complete. Two number residential accommodation for Department of Agri uh, at Gosso, which has also been completed and handed over to the Department for Occupation. Government, in its effort to deepen decentralization and support the capacity of the new Af region, has also awarded on contract the Andamation projects. Regional Administration Block for the National Health Insurance Authority at MIM and is completed an awaiting commission. There is also ongoing works on the Municipal Office Block for National Health Insurance Authority at Gosso. The construction of this said Office Block for NHRA in the Certificate North has also been completed in Kenya. Ongoing construction work on regional police headquarters in Gosso is progressing. The ongoing construction work on two number bungalows for regional police commander and the regional 2IC at Gosso is also progressing. High Court, Circuit Court, Magistrate Court, Magistrate Court buildings and bungalows at Gosso, Dian Kwanta, Fidim and Kukum are also progressing uh, and uh, they are about 85% complete. Regional Highway Office Complex and two normal bungalows at Duan Quanta is also co continuing in earnest. Ongoing construction work of regional office block for the Environmental Protection Agency in Gosso is also about 45% complete. These projects are all ongoing and at various levels of completion. Also, the regional office block for the Youth Employment Agency has been completed and awaiting commissioning. Uh, when Let's turn to the picture. This is the picture of the new RCC. The picture of the new RCC block. And hopefully by uh, the first week, hopefully by the first week of November, it will be commissioned uh, for use. And that is the, the uh, area view of the RCC building. These are the three RCC uh, senior staff bungalows that have been completed. And I'm glad to see that I'm using one of them now. And uh, that is the regional education office at Bichim, which is now being used by the regional uh, uh, office, regional education office, direct fruit. And then these are the bungalows for the regional director of education and his and her deputy and uh, this is also uh, the federal rules regional office at kukum which is also ongoing and will be handed over very soon and these are the two bungalows for the uh, federal rules at kukum and then the regional agri office in gosso is also progressing and then these are the two bungalows for the regional director of Agri and his deputy. And uh, the ongoing uh, regional health directorate at Fidim. Move to the next slide. Yes, and this, these are the two bungalows for. Uh, the regional health directorate, the health director and uh, one of his deputies are occupying these two bungalows as I speak. And uh, the highway of office at foundation level at Eduan Quanta. And these are the two bungalows for the regional highway director and his deputy. 
and uh, the regional police commander's residence and his two RC. This is also uh, ongoing. And the uh, uh, EPA office, which is also ongoing. This is the regional office for uh, the Youth Employment Agency, which has been completed and is awaiting the commission. And the High Court building in Gosso, which is uh, about 85% complete. And uh, the High Court judge, judge's residence in Gosso, which, which will also be handed over to us very soon. And the Circuit Court building at Duan Quanta is also progressing. And then the Circuit Court judge's residence at Duan Quanta is the one on the screen now. And the Magistrate Court building under construction in Huidim. This is also uh, the administration block for Esunafu South District Assembly, which is now being used by the Assembly. Then the three-story Tunnel North Municipal Assembly Block. The Assembly Block they are occupying now is very small and cannot take on the number of staff. So uh, the government under His Excellency Nanado Dankwe Kufuado has decided to give them a three-story administration block, which is under construction. This is also for Asutifi South District Assembly. They also have a similar problem uh, like that of uh, Tunnel North. So they are they have also been given a three-story administration block, which is also under construction. And then any uh, National Health Insurance uh, office block at Gosso for the Municipal Assembly. And then the Regional Office of the National Health Insurance Office at MIM is also uh, complete. It has left with the handing over. And uh, I'm very sure, very soon, it will be handed over to us for use. And then uh, the said NHIS office at SUTF North. This is also uh, complete, and it will be handed over to the assembly for use very soon. So that is for governance. So from the pictorial evidence, you all see uh, what the NPP government under His Excellency Nandado Dankwa Akufuado has been able to do uh, to promote governance in uh, the new Ahafo region. So I now shift to uh, education. Education in Ahafo is improving steadily despite being a relatively very young region. The region over the period has witnessed tremendous improvement in the education sector since 2017, including the upgrading of infrastructure and provision of other amenities and structures. This has created both access and quality for our children, thereby impacting positively on the lives of our people. As you may know, the Regional Directorate of Education is located in Bichim in the Tando South Municipal Assembly, in line with the government's plan to decentralize the regional offices across the region. There are a total of 1,747 public educational institutions in the region, made up of six special TV schools, 20 senior high schools, 438 junior high schools, 577 primary schools, and 706 kindergarten schools. The government, in line with its vision to resource the educational sector, has provided 10 medium-sized buses, 12, uh, two large buses, and one pickup to senior high schools in the region. While six pickups have been provided for municipal and district education directories. Additionally, the regional education directorate has received a Toyota Land Cruiser Prado to facilitate their operations. Under the government flagship free senior high school program, a total of 42,725 students are enrolled in 22 schools, including TVET schools. In addition, I deem it necessary 
to mention some significant achievements of the schools in the region in the area of education. AFO has come first in the Meiji National Standardized Test 2021, organized for basic for all learners nationwide in literacy and numeracy. The region placed second in the 2020 WASI. The region placed first in WASI performance in specific subjects like mathematics, integrated science, and social science. The region also placed second in 2021 WASI and topped in some subjects, specific subjects like English, mathematics, social studies. Four of our BEC uh, candidates in the 2020 examination were decorated by the President of the Republic, His Ex Excellency Nana Rudankwa Akufuadu, during the Presidential Awards this year for their outstanding performance in the BEC. Sewaka Girls Senior High School placed second in the 2022 uh, National Debate Championship. Achesua Senior High School, my school, qualified for the 2021 National Renewable Energy Challenge held in Accra and placed six. Ula Girls came second in the 64th Independence and Versailles National Debate Championship 2021 on the topic Universal Testing for COVID-19 Unnecessary. The Directorate, in collaboration with the Ministry of Communication and Digitalization, trained 1,000 girls and 100 teachers in Girls in ICT initiative. Significantly, the government, with funding from Get Fund in 2020, commenced the construction of a new senior high school, Science and Technology Bias at Akrudi, and the project has, has advanced, and it is our expectation that it will soon be operational. Again, the government, through the Ministry of Education, has invested in the establishment of the State of Art Technical and Vocational Education Training Center at Kenyasi in the certificate of the state. The contractor, Messrs. Planet One Limited, have mobilized to site and work has started. Furthermore, to provide access to tertiary education to the citizens in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, a proposed university for HAFO has been initiated. So far, the site has been acquired to the generosity of the Omanhine of Gosso, Nana Akwesibo Sompra. The Minister of Education is in the process of finalizing the necessary arrangements for the project to commence. In addition, the numerous infrastructure projects undertaken over the period in the regions include the construction of classroom blocks, dormitory blocks, assembly halls, administration blocks, teachers' quarters, dining halls, among others, require specific, specific mention. In turn of South, there are, these are some of the projects that can be uh, found in turn of South. Construction of one number, one, uh, one number, one story dormitory block at Bichim Presbyterian Senior High School in the Tano South Municipal Assembly. Construction of a six unit classroom block at Achanse MA School in Tano South Municipal Assembly. Then, in a certificate north, have construction of one number three unit classroom block, office, store, computer laboratory at Quail Creek Room in a certificate north district. Construction of a single three unit classroom block with office, store, four unit KVRP to Urana change room at Tevia Room in a certificate north district. Rehabilitation of six unit classroom block, office, computer lab, staff Staff conference room, construction of six seater KVRP at Kenya City Number no. One RC Primary School in the CTV North District. Renovation of one number three unit classroom block and construction of one number additional classroom block at Intotroso in the CTV North District. One number two unit KG and a nursery block at Tia Hamadia School at Kenya City Number no. One. Construction of one number six unit classroom block with head teacher's office, store, staff common room, library, six unit KVRP, a changing room at Rashida Islamic Primary School. 
rehabilitation of four-week classroom block at Abuja Kwanta AME Zion School in a city north. One number six three classroom block with teachers' office, staff common room, library, KVRP, Urana changing room at Bojampa DA Primary School. Construction of one number six three classroom block with teachers, head teachers' office, staff common room, library, Urana changing room at Yabrefo in the city north. And then one number CHV classroom block with head teacher's office, store, staff common room, KVRP at Jafikumani SHS and Wamahineso. Then one number TV classroom block with head teacher's office, staff common room, changing room at Intotroso St. Lawrence. And one number eight TV teacher's quarters at Intotroso St. Lawrence EHS. Then one number two unit KG classroom block at Wamahineso. Then two number three seater institutional latrine at Wamahineso. And then uh, three unit classroom block at Odenaho Basic School at Kenya Se. So these are all for uh, a certificate of. Then turn on off. Construction of one number three unit classroom block with ancillary facilities at Sewakesi SHS at Duyan Kwanta. Three number classroom block with ancillary facilities at Boma SHS in the town of municipality. One number two story dormitory block at Yamfo Anglican School. One number six unit classroom block with ancillary facility at Yamfo Methodist in town of. Twelve unit classroom block at Boma SHS, town of. Then three unit classroom block at Tertiary MA in Tannon Off. Then three minute classroom block at Subon Pine in Tannon Off. Three minute classroom block with all ancillary facilities at Bafukrum in Tannon Off. Then one number at six minute classroom block with ancillary facilities at Pentecost MA Primary in Duyan Quanta. Then one number six minute classroom block with ancillary facilities Duyan Quanta MA GHS. Then one number six unit classroom block uh, with ancillary facilities at Dumakwe in Tannon Off. Then a Sunafo South. One number six unit classroom block at Kukum Presby. Three unit classroom block at Kukum Methodist School. One number three unit block at Anyem in Sunafo South. Six unit classroom block at Sankore Methodist. Three unit classroom block at Kwaduma. A guest dormitory at Kukum Agrik Senior High School. 12 unit classroom block at Kukum Agrik Senior High School. 3 unit classroom block at Kukum SDA School. 3 unit classroom block at Kukum Girls Model School. 6 unit classroom block at Tanoso in the Sunafu South. 6 unit classroom block at Nobeko Primary School. 6 unit uh, classroom block at Mintumi and a teacher's quarters at Omi. And a 3 unit classroom block at Kapo Islamic. Then supply of 800 Mundo decks to Kukum Agric Senior High School. Three minute classroom block at Kukum Agric SHS. Then ongoing construction of three minute classroom block at uh, Kukum Agricultural Senior High School in the Sunafu South. Three minute classroom block at Abum. Three minute classroom block CISO. Then 40 minute washroom at Kukum Agric SHS. Then a dining hall complex at Kukum Agric SHS. Then 10 sets of computers to Kukum Methodist Primary School and a presentation of eight motorbikes to circuit supervisors in Kukum and Esunafu South. One number three week classroom block at a uh, one unit classroom block and ancillary facilities at Kwabna Jan in SUTV South. One number four unit chamber and hall teacher quarters at Fidim in SUTV South. One number six unit classroom block with ancillary facilities at uh, Nkasem DA Basic School at Sutifi South. One number three unit classroom block with ancillary facilities at Dadia Suaba Girls Model School. One number three unit classroom block with office at Achirisua. Then one number four unit classroom block, uh, sorry, one number four unit chamber and hall teachers quarters at Fidim in a, a South. One number six unit classroom block 
with ancillary facilities at Nkasem. One numbers three minute classroom block with ancillary facilities at Adia Swaba. One number three minute classroom block uh, at Achesia. One number three minute classroom block at Asensua Senior High School. And then one number 12, 12 unit dormitory block with washroom facilities for boys in Achesia Senior High School. Three story teachers accommodation at Achesia Senior High School. And one number 12 unit dormitory block with washroom facilities at the Adia Soaba Nursing Training College in the CTV South. One number four unit classroom block with office, store, and other ancillary facilities at Amam Frum in the CTV South. One number teachers quarters at Bruni Krum, and uh, one number 12 unit dormitory block for VDM Senior High School. Construction of boys' dormitory at uh, VDM Senior High School. And then one number three week classroom block with office and store at Mehame. One number six week classroom block at Mankasim in the city south. And then one number 12 unit dormitory block with four school facilities for girls at Achinusia Senior High School. One number three week classroom block with office, store, computer, and other ancillary facilities at Mankasim Methodist, GHS, in the city south. And one number six unit classroom block at Fidim SHS. Then as to Nafo North, construction of three unit classroom block with all other facilities at Akrudie Nyamibachre. One number six unit classroom block at Mim Senior High School. Three unit classroom block at Fahuya Day. One number three unit classroom block at Ayimaye. One number three unit classroom block at Diasi. One number three minute classroom block at Inferma. One number three minute classroom block with all other facilities at Kofi Mirkroom. One number three minute classroom block with all other facilities at Bidiakon. Three minute classroom block at Gosso SD in the Sunafu North. One number three minute classroom block with all other facilities at Sachel Kroom. One number three week classroom block with all facilities at Ampin Crew. Three minute classroom block with a biodigester facility at Gosso MA. Three minute classroom block at Ayumso. And one number three minute classroom block with all other facilities at Peter Crew. And uh, a thousand dual decks and hundred mundu decks supplied, supplied to schools in the municipality. One number three week classroom block with staff and other ancillary facilities at Dominasi. And then one number three week classroom block at Abidjan. And then a guest dormitory at Mim Senior High School. And a six unit classroom block at Akrudi. And uh, uh, a seven detached teacher's bungalow at Aniapi. Three unit classroom block at Kumoso. And 12 seater water cruiser facility at Ahafumai Senior High School. Three unit classroom block at Ayumso and six unit classroom block with all other facilities at Kwekwekra and one, one number six unit classroom block uh, at Gosso Anglican School. One number six unit classroom block at Ahafumai Senior High School and two story 12 unit classroom block at Mim Senior High School. A guest dormitory at Mim Senior High School and three unit classroom block at Mim Akwabua. And then three unit classroom block at Mim SDA. So these are the projects so far. So we come to the pictorial evidence. And uh, what you see in the, uh, on the screen is the uh, 12 unit classroom block at Kukum Agricultural Senior High School. Then uh, a guest dormitory block at Kukum Agricultural Senior High School. Then the teachers accommodation for accommodation for teachers at Achinsua Senior High School. Then Yamfo Anglican SHS in the town of municipality. That is their two uh, story administration uh, boys dormitory. Then the boys dormitory for Fidim uh, SHS. Then the classroom block 
for the science, science, science technology and mass education school at Akrodie. And that is the teacher's quarters for the proposed school at Akrodie. And that is the area view of the school in Akrodie. And uh, that is also uh, part of the area view of the school in Akrodie. And uh, the TV school has uh, started at Kukum and it is uh, at the foundation level. And uh, that is the town of so, uh, classroom block in the Sunafo South. Then, uh, C.S.U.D. classroom block at Mitumi under construction in the Sunafo South. And the Kukum Agriculture Senior High School, that is their dining hall, which is under construction. And then, the C.S.U.D. classroom block also under construction in uh, Nobeko, Sunafo South. Then the Sankor Methodist School, which is at the foundation level. And then three winning classroom block at CISO in Esunafo South. Then the Kukum Agri SHS, the three winning classroom block. Then Abum, three winning classroom block in Esunafo South. Then Kwaduma School which has been handed over and is being used by uh, the children at Kwaduma. Then, three-minute classroom block at Kukum Girls Model School. Kukum SD School in the Sunafu South, that is their three-minute classroom block. Then, uh, presentation of eight motorbikes to circuit supervisors to ensure that they are able to do their supervisory work well. This was uh, handed over to them by the district assembly. And then the three-week classroom block for Sewakes Girls Senior High School. Then boys' dormitory for Previsteran Senior High School, which is in town of South. Then Achiasi MA Basic School, uh, town of South. Three-week classroom block, Boma SHS. Turn on off. Six unique classroom block at Yamfo Methodist. Turn on off. Do we need kindergarten uh, at Biancuanta? Turn on off. Then two, 12 unique classroom block for Boma SHS in turn on off. Six unique classroom block at Jemfiku Menini SHS at Omahineso. And then three unique classroom block with head teacher's office and other facilities at uh, Ntotroso, St. Lawrence. Then Odenoho Business School, three unique classroom block, Kajase. Then uh, Omahineso, uh, three unique, three. Uh, Two number, number six week classroom block, Rashida Islamic Primary School in Totroso. Three week classroom block at Subampai Methodist, turn on off. Then single story, two week classroom block with office and store at Tevia Chrome in Asutifi North. Uh, Asutifi North. Is Yes. Then, uh, CSU classroom block at Entotrosu College of Nelson in Sutifi North. Then, we have uh, Kenyase number one RC primary school. That is their CSITA uh, KVIP uh, place of convenience. Then, one number three week classroom block. An additional classroom at Intotroso in a city north. And then Dubakwe says we need classroom block, turn on off. Then uh, TI Ahmedia School, Kenya say that's their two unit KG and nursery classroom block. Then uh, one number eight unit teachers quarters at Intotroso St. Lawrence 
JHS. One number two, we did KG classroom block at Wamahineso. Then uh, Bafukrum in Tanonov, that is their three unit classroom block. Then six unit classroom block, Pentecost MA Primary School, Duan Quanta, Tanonov. Six unit classroom block, Duan Quanta, MA JHS. Then uh, Kukum Presby, six unit classroom block. Three unit classroom block at Kukum Methodist Primary School in the Sunafo South District. Then three unit classroom block, uh, Don Kukum, which is under construction as Sutifi North. Then uh, 12 unit boys' dormitory at Achinisuya Senior High School in Asutifi South District. Another 12 unit girls' dormitory at Achinisuya Senior High School, Asutifi South District. One number three unit classroom block with office and store at Mehame. And then uh, eight unit dormitory block at Dadia Swaba Nursing Training College in Asutifi South. Teachers Quartet, Hidim, Ronnie Krum in the South. South. Amam from four unit classroom block in the South. Teachers Flat at Hidim SHS in the South District. Then in Kassem, six unit classroom block in the South. Two-story 12 unit classroom block at MIM SHS, Asunafo North Municipal Assembly. One number three unit classroom block, MIM SDA in Asunafo North. Three unit classroom block with staff common room at Kofi Mier Room. Then uh, one number three unit classroom block, Ampin Crow. Guest Dormitory Mim Senior High School, as soon as enough. Then Dua Dex supplied to schools in as soon as enough. Then uh, we move to the health sector. Undoubtedly, the health sector is one of the most important sectors of the Ghanaian society. So far, there are a total of 113 health facilities in the Afro region, made up of 13 district hospitals, health centers, clinics, and chip compounds. Upon assumption of office and following the creation of the region, government has committed to making huge investments into improving the infrastructure in the health sector. This is in line with the vision to create and expand access as well as enhance the quality of self service delivery. Various development projects in the health sector in the region were commenced and has progressively, with some being completed and others still under construction. Construction of a polyclinic in the region has commenced and is going on at MIM in the Sunafunov Municipal Assembly being funded by the Ministry of Health and executed by Vanem Construction Limited. Work is at 45% complete and progressing steadily. Also, the government flagship Agenda 111 hospital project have taken off in the region. The contractors have mobilized to site and construction at Kukum and Kenya are both at the substructure stage. Judging from the activity at the size, we believe that work will be completed on schedule in line with His Excellency's, the President's vision. In Asutifi uh, South, we have construction of Doctors' Bangalore at Dadeswaba in Asutifi South. 
uh, construction of ship compounds at Kukuntri So in Asutifi South District, which is about 98% uh, complete and awaiting finishing and commissioning. Then Asutifi North, construction of District Hospital in Kenyase in Asutifi North. This district funded by the district assembly has been completed and facility, the facility is in use. The construction of one number staff quarters at Gambia in the Asutifi North District. Currently, work is 40% progressing steadily. Construction of nurses' quarters at Gambia in the Asutifi North. Work is also ongoing with the construction of infectious disease center at Gosu Municipal Assembly by Mrs. Crefes Company Limited, funded by the Minister of Health. Work is 79% complete. Work on the construction of VRP ward at Gosu Municipal Hospital is 98% complete. Contractor is on site to finish up the work for handing over. Construction of ship compound at Dutum in the Esunafu North Municipal Assembly is being sponsored by the Assembly and is 97% complete. Construction of one number chip compound at Ario Homensia in the Sunafu North Municipal Assembly. Work has been completed on chip compound at Pomakrum in the Sunafu North Municipal. Work has also been completed on the construction of maternity ward at Gosso in the Sunafu North Municipal. Construction of nurses' quarters at Gosso in the Sunafu North Municipal. Two number semi detached staff bungalow at Gosso in Esunafu North Municipal. Construction of wide number chip compound and uh, su supply of uh, furniture and uh, drilling and mechanization of wide number borehole at Esukesi in Esunafu North Municipal. And the construction of clinic at Mensakrum in Esunafu North. Construction of ward and nurses quarters at Ayumso and Fahuya Den Health Centers and construction of ship compound at Dutum in Esunafu North Municipal. In Esunafu South, expansion of OPD at Kukum District Hospital is about 70% complete. Government has undertaken the construction of an administration block at Kukum District Hospital. The project has been completed and currently in use. Construction of one number, two unit single room self contained nurses' quarters at Aboom in the Sunafo South. And uh, the Assembly has also constructed a clinic at Ajumem and then Pafo. Then turn on off. Construction of maternity ward at Boma Hospital, being funded by the Tano North Municipal Assembly and at, undertaken by Frank Stein Company Limited, is 99% complete. Construction of female ward is being sponsored by Honorable Member of Parliament for Tano North, Honorable Freda Prepe, which is 56% complete and work is progressing. There is also construction of female work at Tano Chrome, being funded by the Municipal Assembly, and work is 70% complete. The government is also embarking on construction of chip compound at Adengu in Tano North Municipal Assembly and is 90% complete. Construction of Chip compound at Yache is ongoing. Construction of chip compound at Atudrobesa is currently progressing. The Tanan of Municipal Assembly has provided hostel facilities for students of the College of Health, Yangfo, and the Community Health Nursing and Midwifery uh, College at Tanoso. A solution center completed and used at St. Joseph's of God Hospital, Yankwanta. Administration block at a nursing and midwifery college at Duanquanta. The Honorable Member of Parliament of Tano South, Honorable uh, Sachre, uh, is also sponsoring the construction of a female and child, a children's ward at Derma, and work is 70% complete. Also, the government has constructed staff quarters for health personnel at Jumo in the Tano South municipality. Construction and furnishing of one number chip compound at Ada in Tano Municipality and the completion of one number chip compound at Jumo in Tano South Municipality. Completion and furnishing of one number chip compound with nurses quartet at Breme in Tano South. And then chip compound and two seater 
WC toilet at Mansin Internal South, and one number chief compound of nurses quarters at Kosu Internal South, and one number chief compound of nurses quarters at Esuboy Internal South. So uh, we look at the pictorial evidence, and uh, the picture we have is. Uh, the Agenda 1-1 project at Esunafu South, which is at the foundation level. And as I speak, contractors are on site. And hopefully, they will be able to hand over the project to the government and for that matter, the region on schedule. Then this is also Agenda 1-1 project at Kenyasi, which is also uh, progressing and is at the foundation level. As I speak, there are contractors on site. And in each of the projects, you have about three contractors each during various, working on the various aspects of the hospital. And this is the uh, polyclinic, which is ongoing at MIM. Then cheap compound in Esukesi, in uh, Esunafo uh, North. Then nurses quarters at Gosso uh, Municipal Hospital. And then the maternity ward at uh, Gosso Municipal Hospital. Then the VIP ward at Gosso Municipal Hospital. Then uh, maternity ward at Boma Hospital. And then ship compound at Boma, uh, Boma Crew in Esunafo North Municipal, Municipality. Then the Infectious Disease Center at Gosso Municipal Hospital. Then the Chip Compound and Staff Quartet at Kopong in Esunafo South. Then Chip Compound at Kunkuntreso in Esutifi South. Then Chip Compound at Amankwa Krum, which is under construction at Esunafo South. And then Administration block at Kukum Desert Hospital in Esunafo South. Then Desert uh, Hospital in Kenyasi. Then the Isolation Center at St. John's of God Hospital at Diangwanta. Then Hostel for Students of College of Health, Yamfo, Tanonov. Then uh, Doctors Baglu. St. John's of God Hospital, Biancanta. Nurses Training uh, and Midwifery College, Tanoso, uh, Students Hostel. And then Chip Compound, Ajumem, in Esunafo South. Then uh, Staff Quarters, in Tano South. Then uh, Nurses Quarters, Gambia, in the City North. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you've seen all the pictorial evidence on the projects that I've listed so far. So, ladies and gentlemen, the government is confident of a strong and resilient country that will meet the development aspirations of our people. I therefore urge all and sundry to put their shoulders to the wheel so that we can together propel our dear nation to the, de to the level we would all be proud of. Additionally, I wish to appeal to all citizens of Ahafo to keep faith with us as we endeavor to deliver on our promises to the people of this dear region of ours. Finally, I wish to take this unique opportunity to express my sincerest appreciation to all citizens of Ahafo for your support, cooperation, and contribution towards the achievements of the vision of His Excellency, Nanadudankwa Akufuado, for the overall development of our region in particular, and the nation as a whole. On this note, I wish to once again thank the Minister of Information for the kind invitation to this media interaction. And I also thank the members of the media who are here in their numbers to help propagate the good news of Ahafu. Thank you, and may God bless us all.
Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. I was just so excited that the projects are not just concentrated in the regional capital, from Achirinsuya to Hidiem to Gosu to Kukum to Mem to Kenya, say, Diayan Kwanta, Akodie, Ntotroso, or Mahinso, Sankori. Everywhere. Everywhere. Gambia, yes. <laughs> There are projects, and I was excited about the fact that most of the projects are completed and in use. And a few of them that are not completed are at various uh, levels of construction. So that was so uh, insightful. I was happy to see all of that. So that uh, in our daily interactions, it won't be that, oh, we are just saying. Seeing is believing for you to see the pictures, and especially for the people on the ground, who are really feeling the impact of some of these investments by the president's Akufuado led government was, was just so inspiring. So, Honorable George Boache, thank you so much for the insightful presentation. It was also interesting to note that although today's presentation is focused on governance, health, and, and education, there was so much to say and so much to see. So, it is my hope that. With all these impactful things, about 1,747 1, institutions benefiting from these projects and facelifts, and 113 health facilities benefiting from some of these projects that are being undertaken in the region. I'm just happy and hope that subsequently we'll be able to meet to talk about other aspects of development that are happening in the region. So thank you so much, Honorable Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, on that note, we will take your questions. If you have any questions for the minister, you need to clarify anything. This is the best time to ask. So it was so elaborate, we may not take so many questions. So this may be the only round. Okay, so I've seen one hand at the back and two and three. We can take up to five questions. So if you have any question, please. Uh, show by hand your name and media house and then proceed to ask okay so uh, my name is edward aqua i'm with the gna so the proposed term university uh, first of all is it going to benefit your people and uh, where have you got into as far as um, preparations are concerned when is construction start thank you for the question My name is Fred Dalanyo Megashi with GH1 TV. Um, I'd want to find out from the Honorable Minister um, in terms of inflation because the Ghana Statistical Service in its recent consumer price index report indicated that the half region is the second highest with inflation rate of 15.4%. And now looking at the region with a, you know, looking at the region that is the highest food basket of the country. How did you receive the long BG from the finder? Uh, the minister in his presentation did not give us any numbers uh, in terms of amounts that went into the construction of these projects. So if you could give us some numbers. Also, uh, many of the projects were low rise. There was about 90, 99% of them were low rise. There was not much. That they were not story buildings. Yes, yeah, story buildings. So why, why are they not? Um, focus so much on uh, vertical, vertical rather than yeah. horizontal. Okay, thank you. Mm. Okay, I saw Nana's hand. David, this way. And I think I saw another hand here. Oh, it was yeah. Uh, good morning. Um, I want to find out all these projects. Did they start from 2019 or some of them were just continuation of uh, existing projects. And secondly, you didn't mention that. Nana, you meant 2017 or 2019? Well, the region came to be, I think, in 2019, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then with respect to education, I think the region did exceptionally well. What accounted for that? Okay. What accounted for your um, impeccable record in terms of education? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, please, if anyone, okay, I can see a hand at the back. Uh, good morning, Honorable. Medindia Kukraba, Mewakasa FM. 
Uh, honorable, uh, make a uh, presentation you know, on my success stories of the Ahafu region. I want to find out, as food basket of Ghana, uh, challenges being a region in uh, Kumu, and then what are they doing to tailor those challenges? Because we are a quiet idea a how we are in terms of what they in me and any free a full moon any idea a back room no when you find out what are they doing to tell you those challenges thank you thank you for the question if i don't see any hand i take that to be the last question okay we'll take yours good morning honorable that was an insightful presentation my name is brad flip donko and i report for the daily statesman i'd like to find out in terms of this uh, completed and then those projects are still ongoing to get completed. With regards to maintenance culture, what is your outfit doing in order to ensure that most of these projects are really protected for the benefit of the entire citizenry? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I take that to be the last question. Okay, thank you so much. So we'll go to the Honorable Minister for his responses. I, I will start from the last. On the maintenance culture, we were, when, when I took over, you know, I was a DC chief executive first during President Bufo's time, and then now the regional minister. So when I met my MMDCs the first time, I told them, because I'm very conversant with the region, I know every, every corner of the region. I told them that most of the, the, the buildings we put up during Kufo's time, uh, most of them are worn out. And therefore, they should go back and then try to do rehabilitation of some of these projects. So in the same vein, in the same vein, most of the projects that we are putting up now, I've asked them to attach seriously maintenance culture to them they shouldn't allow them to rot before they come back and then do rehabilitation. So maintenance culture will be taken seriously. And then uh, one of you asked about the challenges we are facing as food basket of the region. Definitely, you know, most of the farms are in the villages. And the access to some of, most of these farms is very difficult because of the nature of the rules that we have. But in spite of this, we managed to bring the, 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 the food staffs into the market. But our major problem is bias. And uh, I also want to use this opportunity to appeal to Ghanaians and all other investors, investors to come to our fund and invest. We are in the, in the food season now. We have a lot of plantain getting rotten. Whereas we can add value to some of this and then uh, uh, export, the, export them outside to earn the needed for, for the exchange. So I'm here appealing to Ghanaians through this medium that anybody who is willing to invest in plantain industry should come to uh, Ahafo. Not even, not only plantain, but in food. You have plenty of food now in Gosso. Today is Wednesday. Go to Gosso Market and see. Go to Gosso Market and see. Some of the food serves will be left in the market to go rotten. We, we are sitting on money. And we need investors to come and help us to unearth this money. And then, uh, one also asks about why you don't put up high-rise buildings. You know, land is, we don't have problem of land in, in, in Ahafo. Maybe that is why. But we, we will take this as an advice, and then I will advise my implementers or the implementation agencies, the, the municipal and the district assemblies, to cultivate the habit of putting up high rise buildings. And then when the statistical service came out with the food inflation of 15.4, I said to myself, I will not agree. Because go, go, go to Hafansi. 
Go to tertiary. Go to tertiary. Tomatoes are getting rotten. Pepper. Everything is there. Yam. Go to Gosu Market today. Then tomorrow, go to Sankori. Go to Kasape. Go to Hidia. Hidia Market is, I think, on uh, uh, Friday. Go there and see. Food is getting rotten. So maybe when you sit in Accra and then try to determine the infl inflation rate in half of forest, I don't think we will agree. <laughs> we will not. Because so far as Ahafo is concerned, food is no problem. And we can supply Ghana food. And then the proposed university. We had a letter from the Minister of Education that Ahafo has been selected for the construction of a science, mass, and technology university. And therefore, we should acquire land for that purpose. I consulted the Omahine of Gosso traditional area, Nana Akosibu Sompra, who gave us uh, 140 acre land. We have prepared the site plan and have submitted the plan to FPMU, Funds and Procurement Management Unit. So all other things will come from the Ministry of Education. But I'm hopeful but that sooner than later, uh, contractors will be selected and work will start on the proposed university. Thank you. Yo, Abu Shamfo, I'm saying, Yakasa Kakra, Nakasa, Yakasa Irinan, Yapotoy. And he said, Abeya, Abema, Amanfo, Ehu, dear El Koso, Ewa Afo, Mantemu, Embra, Eura President, Adaroma, or Mayan, Yana Rigin, say near Hosono, and Ukem, Af Rigin, IT, Abue, if he said, First Rona, and never be a ha. One question, Yania, is a beer, Oba, Kumasi, and then in nature, most of the basic services in Yano, in Yanho, are Enam Regina, you are president, the Amaya Sunti, Ama, Puntubi, Akoso, Ewa Hafo, Ebina, E. Echremono, Minim, sir, and Chibia, Bia, Obisia, Vubiano, who say yes, or see a Maya, or de or no, and a Shabre, Ashanin, sir. Say Obaku na Wadinim. In the Mesremo as media men. Say Mufriha was so Mumwa Minim and Penny for near more a half Especially your investment opportunities will be your home. Say Uko Mima, your member. Ah, say in Yambesa Bia no Baho, but develop that area a very profitable holiday resort. A mem crone mono, your mamma lake you are over ground when you budget. You hear investors now or more about the boy. So, of course, a tunnel so a bay and foie tunnel river now or horn. You are then chimney a mad fish, you ma, who bow with Sema now or moba. See near for cake. And he said, In your investor crowner, obey devolve for my ya, and say, and also a baboy. It is, sir, Ubiya and Nadia, sir, O Sika, no paper be the investor. I have for her. Nana no moon fast as a more day. A born in your day. Anna, your own auntie and my bawa, or Miss Ray ready, sir, or more a bay juma, a boa, a maha for a coronin, a magana, a coronin. It is, Madame Sibri, or Embra, Munya, a dear mammy. A cause of soa. Yabama, Nananmo, a smarty, sir. I have one day row, actually, I'm also my son, say, Bob Boy, I'm your turn, I have four. Yagana, name him, if you ask me, you know, to be the most every. Honorable ministers, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for making time to join us this morning. So, you heard the minister. Please help us spread the word. And if you have a regional minister who is interested in drawing a lot of investment, you know that when you get to the region, there wouldn't be any bottlenecks. He will do all the hand-holding and assistance for you to be able to establish businesses in the region. So once again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you.
See how we are dressed, me and you. We have covered our balls, but we are just like goats and dogs. It should be handy. So this is one of the main reasons. Yes, it should be. Protect and let them be free. Data has shown that about 3 million babies have been born through the in vitro fertilization process, commonly known as IVF. It is gaining popularity as one of the ways through which people can make babies artificially. What is the process like? What does it take to have an IVF? And which people qualify to have an IVF? Today I'm at the Medifem Multi Specialist and Fertility Center to find all these answers for you. But before I introduce my guests, Let's take a short break. We'll be right back. So you're welcome back from that short break. And I'm here with a principal fertility specialist at the Medifem Multi-Specialist and Fertility Center. His name is Dr. Nana Henaku Labi. Hello, Doc. Hello. So yes. today we want to talk about IVF. I know the full name is in vitro fertilization, if I'm right. Yes. What is IVF? IVF, in vitro fertilization. I think before you understand what it really means, you must know what is the normal. And the normal is any couple who want to get a baby there are certain four things which have to be satisfied. Okay. Number one, it's the sperm of the man. Mm. Two, the egg of the woman. The egg and the sperm, they meet in the place called the fallopian tube. Mm. So egg, sperm, they meet in the tube. That's where fertilization takes place. Yes. So in normal settings, normal life, fertilization of a, a woman's egg is in the fallopian tubes. After the fertilization, the fertilized egg would drop down to settle in the uterus, in the womb. Mm -hmm. So these are the four things which are required for any couple to get a baby. The womb, the sperm, the egg, fallopian. the fallopian tubes where fertilization takes place and then it settles in the womb. Four things, always, but for some reason um, you cannot have the fertilization inside the womb of the woman and fertilizing an egg or the woman's egg with the sperm outside the woman's body is in vitro fertilization. And in vitro means outside the body. It's a glass, it's a, a Greek expression for in glass. So in vitro fertilization simply means fertilizing the egg 
of the woman or whatever okay. outside her body. Right. So when do when a couple supposed to go for an IVF? Which indirectly means what are the reasons for IVF? Yeah. So after an egg is fertilized in vitro, we put the resulting fertilized egg, which is now called embryo, we put it inside the womb and let the thing grow and eventually the baby is born after nine months or so. Now, anything which will obstruct you from getting a baby may lead on to getting that fertilized egg outside the woman's body. Anything. And I group them into four. Into four reasons where uh, how a pregnancy takes place. So if there's a problem with the egg, pro with the egg itself, I start with the egg. I start with the, then followed by the sperm. And then where fertilization takes place, the tube. And then it settles in the womb. So I simply have to go through this for egg production. Sometimes the woman, you do everything, you are able to you give all those things, you think everything else is normal, but no pregnancy. Yeah. So it eventually ends up with us bringing the egg out and fertilizing outside, that's doing the IVF. The next one is the sperm. It's assuming everything is normal, and then the sperm is sort of deficient, it's not. If you introduce a sperm through the normal way, they won't be able to reach the, the egg itself. In that case, even the sperm, defective sperms, we can use the defective sperm in an IVF setup. That normally, you need half a million sperms mm. to fertilize one egg in normal life. Yeah. But if the def sperm is defective, what we do is <coughs> we take the egg, get the best out of the sp sperm, which is good, mix them outside. So that becomes an IVF due to uh, sperm, low sperm reason. And again, on the other hand, in certain situations, the, the sperms are so low, it cannot be used even in simple IVF setup. So we have to take one sperm, take one egg, and ourselves inject that sperm into the egg. And the process is called ECSI intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Okay, so if there's a case where maybe the sperms are the problem, the woman is okay and everything, they still have to do an IVF to be able to get a baby? Not necessarily. Okay. If all is well with the woman and the um, sperm cells are not good at all. Unfortunately, we have to do an IVF. But if at some stage um, the sperms are good, are not good, but they are not that bad, we can wash them, sip them, and do a process called IUI, intrauterine insemination. But even that you know, it means we are preparing the sperm to inject into the womb to, for the sperm to go and meet the egg inside the tube. But some are so weak, they cannot... Look, you measure sperm quantity 
in millions. If you do a sperm check, they will tell you the normal is 10 million per mil or 10, 20 million and above for the whole thing. And then, and so you, you wonder why all these 20 millions, but you need only one sperm. And that is where XC comes in, or IUI comes in. But unfortunately, if you do IUI, you don't actually see the problem if it fails, if it doesn't work. You wouldn't know. Why? Yeah, but with IVF, you can see fertilization. You can see that there's something going on. Unfortunately, the baby is not well formed and eventually it may not happen. So I was asking, what's the chance when I do an IVF that it will be successful? Because it's just like science. Medicine is not only Exactly. It is not exact. You think you are succeeding at the end of it. In the whole world is about 37% chance of getting a success with the first IVF, with a single IVF. The whole world, not certain places, a little bit higher due to maybe superior conditions or techniques or whatever. It's a slightly higher, but it it's ours. We are an average of fifty point something. Some and it fluctuates. It depends on who you are dealing with. An elderly person going through a normal IVF, the chances are not as high compared to a young, a younger person aged in the 20s and things. If other things are okay, but an IVF is required, they have a higher chance of sometimes over 70 percent, 77 percent chance of getting pregnant. Because I was going to ask what age the best advice of all to have an IVF? The best age to have a baby in any woman is 22. Oh. Huh? <laughs> 22 years is the best age to have a baby. Wow. This thing is stuck in my brain for a long, long time since I was... It's the best age. The younger you are, it's not that good for a young girl of 18, 19 to have a baby. The older you are, then it's going towards, women have an expiry date. From 35 onwards, mm -hmm. your fertility potential drops drastically, mm -hmm. declines. So if you are 35, so for instance, if you come to me at the age of 28 or 24, 6, and that you have an infertility problem. It will take time to go through. But if you are already 35 plus, we wouldn't give you the normal time that people expect you to get pregnant. No, we'll start investigating immediately. Because the, as the older you are, the less likely your fertility potential. Very interesting, <laughs> quite intriguing. 22 years is the best age. age for having a baby. And the longer it takes, the higher your chances. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, um, how is the procedure like? Is it painful? Is it stressful? Um, okay. Is it expensive? Let me start from the bottom. Expensive, yes, it is. But comparatively to other nations, I think we are very cheap in Ghana. Like how much? Normally, in the US, in, for instance, you spend more than $15,000 to uh, go through an IVF procedure. Ghana is roughly about $5,000. Dollars. Dollars. Okay. Max, dollars roughly and it depends on various units you know there are some units which are we all differ 
a bit, but averagely, in fact, I was estimating we were much less than the five thousand dollars. But and, and because the exchange rate, that that's um, that's a problem. But that's the average cost of. Uh, we don't charge in dollars; we charge in cities. Then, yeah, in fact, I was having a headache. I, I was taking paracetamol. You see, I was squeezing my face <laughs> just to take the tablets. Everything is uncomfortable in medicine, but we try to limit the pain as much as possible. Is it painful? What is IVF? How do we do it? We do that by giving you a series of injections which takes you about two weeks every day you have to take that injection and then once <coughs> sorry you get to a level where we are putting the baby inside there are another series of injections until the baby is well established which takes another month or two so injections itself in IVF is very, very uncomfortable. People complain a lot that sometimes my buttocks is swollen and that. So that's number one, where you experience pain. Two, when it's time to go and you've produced the eggs, you've got to collect the eggs from the woman. And that is called egg retrieval. That's the second part of IVF. And of course, we use some long needle through the vagina using an ultrasound to prick. So it's not a major operation. It's an uncomfortable situation where you use a needle to go and aspirate all the eggs. And after that, 20, 30 minutes, they are gone. They go home after that. But the Procedure is uncomfortable, so we give you something called conscious sedation. Conscious, mm. you are sort of, but you are fully sedated, no pain, nothing, and it's a very brief period, normally not more than 20 30 minutes for the egg collection, depending on the number, some 10. So, yes, that bit is a bit uncomfortable. So you feel some pain. Your eggs are fertilized outside and five days later you have to put the eggs into the womb. And that one it's ideally it's not painful. It's just like having a normal relation with your husband. You know, you feel something being down there and minutes, seconds, we push the baby inside. So how is sperm collection like from the man? How do we collect the sperm? We don't put needles and things like in the woman, but the main um, source, the main source is from masturbation. Okay. You know what that is? Yes. Have you done it before? <laughs> I'm not a boy. I'm not a man. <laughs> so they masturbate and then see the fluid coming out and uh, sometimes it's very difficult for the clients, the patients mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sorry I made a joke with it but some need their wives to come and help them to do that. We resist uh, from, we resist uh, whatever you call it from having sex in order to produce the sperm that you lose a lot, especially the initial sperms, you know. You may lose them, but that's where the concentrated things may be. Okay. So having sex to having sex to produce sperm, it's um, we cannot we don't advise. On the other hand, there there are certain cases where there is no sperm. Normally, we have to dig into the testis area and, and aspirate some sperms. This is a special condition where there are no sperms even when they make their normal 
ejaculation, uh, no sperm. So we have to find uh, some sperm around the testes there and aspirate to to use it to to, to do the IVF. Right. Thank you very much. At this point, we'll go for a quick break where we um, speak to one of the people who have undergone IVF. She'll share her experience with us and how um, the whole process was for her. When we come back, we'll speak more to Doc. So currently I'm with Akosia. She's had an IVF procedure and she was successful. So she's going to share with us what she went through, how the process was like for her. Hello Akosia and thank you for speaking to us today. So I just want to know how your IVF process was like. Oh my God's grace, I would say mine has been successful all the time because uh, I think I first came here 2014 and I mean a distance marriage so it's like oh you are okay nothing is wrong so let's give you medication then you try your natural cycle we tried it up till 2017 still then the doctor said then let's go and do IVF so we've been We've learned a whole lot of stories. When you go do IVF first time, it's not successful. You have to do multiple times, blah, blah, blah. So it's like I was scared, but I held on to my faith. So my, with my first attempt, like medication, first they'll give you medication. I think they said my problem was PCOS. Okay. PCOS, so they'll give you medication to boost the eggs, then the maturity of the eggs, everything comes as well. Then they retrieve the eggs. So after the retrieval of the eggs, they are expecting that within the next five days, you'll be fine for them to transfer the embryos. But with my first five days, I had something called OHSS. Without one, you bloat, then you vomit, like you cannot even eat. You feel hungry, but you cannot eat. Mm -hmm. And it's like you are not by yourself. So because of that, I cannot take it on the fifth day. So you have to treat me and wait till the next month. So by God's grace, the next month when I came, they transferred and everything was fine. I think my first pregnancy was triplets, but along the line, it's like two couldn't stay and left with one. And they were saying, people were saying, hey, I will have the they will, remember, they will stitch your womb, do blah blah blah. But with God's grace, they didn't stitch my womb. Everything was successful. My girl is now four years, mm -hmm. thick tall girl. And I think later on, we said oh, we want more. So after two years, we came back again to do the same thing again. That one too was successful. I had a successful pregnancy. But just that along the line, um, I had an ovarian cyst which ruptured so now I couldn't control the pain with the pregnancy so they have to remove the pregnancy so with that everything mm, got the treatment I have to take time before then I came again so when I came again it's like that one too after the retrieval of eggs because mostly it's like I go for 15 eggs 17 eggs, but with this one I hated 36 eggs so that means it wasn't easy. So I bloated. My stomach was like eight months pregnancy. I was in five square. So they have to treat me again. And with that one, I was like always, I think I'm strong. So sometimes I even go home and come back for the treatment, then go back again. So with this one day, as soon as I went home, the net, I was, they told me I should stay because I'm not looking well. And I saw then I said me I'll go home because mostly when I finish I drive and go back home. And he said, Hey, so is that what you've been doing? It's not good, it's serious. You have to stay. So I didn't stay. I didn't mind them and I went to oh, I fainted. So that means I have to rush back. I said it's my own I saw then uh, but I can say when I came back they treat me they they were, one thing I like about them is no matter what they have time they have patience they'll talk to you well 
and they will call you to check on you even i can say i have almost all of them the anonymous my husband too in case of any tv in the night my husband will call them my wife is not feeling fine they will call you come wherever the medication is they will try and take the medication so you'll become fine so with that one too i had to wait again then come and do the transfer again and one good thing is mostly my the semen they use is not fresh because my husband is not around so mostly it's stored semen so just imagine the owner of the hospital will tell you that we are good because imagine the stored semen that we use for it uh-huh it's a stored semen and even after that they have to uh, store the embryos too for like three four months before the trans yeah with some people with their man will be there the owner they take the semen and put it in but with my not that but at the end of the day i get successful results me fine they are doing their job but i believe in god too i know without god nothing can be possible so one last thing i want to ask is how was the journey like emotionally how were you feeling <laughs> it's not easy because last time i told one lady at the front desk Climbing this staircase up there, having, having hoop, what pains me is you have to always come for injections. There is not the medication alone that you take alone. The injections alone you take, especially before they retrieve the eggs. And after the retriever and they transfer, you have to take an injection again. That injection, uh, the one giving you the injection is not painful. The injection, Adrena, Kasana, they give it to you. And after that, you could see say, Otonina. Oh hey, yeah. So me, if somebody is sitting somewhere and especially come and beat my daughter there, I'll kill you. <laughs> yes, because the pain and emotionally alone. Because last year when I miscarried, it's like when I'm walking, I've been crying. Because after that, you know, you have to also see the doctor come again for that ovarians that I had because of the PCOS that I have. It's likely that it will come so it's not their fault it's normal the experience emotionally just imagine somebody sitting there the husband is sitting beside her the lady was crying when i got there she was crying i was said i was say it's painful and i said really it's painful go and ask her if it is painful how many eggs did you get she would tell you like 10 15 but me 37 eggs even if it was painful i didn't cry who did i go and cry to my husband is not here my mother is not here so I just keep quiet and lie down and fold my arms. So emotionally, it's not easy. All right. Thank you very much you for sharing your experience with us. She says the process, even though quite painful, is worth it at the end of the day. Let's go back to Doc and conclude the conversation. Yeah, welcome back. So I'm seated back with Doc in this part we're going to talk about some of the controversial things that we've heard people say about IVF. What people um, women who go through IVF are supposed to do, some of the facts, the misconceptions and all of those things surrounding it. Doc, welcome back and thank you for um, staying with us. So thank you. Heard Personally, I've heard people say that when you have an IVF, um, the likelihood of getting two or more babies is very high. I've seen someone who has given birth to four quadruplets, and everybody said well, she did an IVF, and she also confirmed that she did an IVF. So, what's the chance of getting multiple babies from an IVF? And if that is very true, why is it the case? Yes, um, normally you've stimulated, you get <coughs> a lot of eggs, you fertilize them, sometimes you get as much as 10, 15 fertilized eggs which are called embryos. So actually we discuss with the patient how many do you want to put in? and. Those some of them who have been, you know, a, a, a yearning for a baby, 
for a long time, they would tell you, doctor, put five, doctor, put four. But elsewhere in the US, UK, you are not allowed to put more than one. Mm. Ghana, we don't have a law restricting us. Okay. But I will tell you soon, we will have, because we are working on it, the government and then our association together we are working on a, a draft to regulate. regulate these things and yes we put for us not more than three if anybody even wants three I, they have to take special permission from me before i agree otherwise we normally put one two and yes sometimes three it depends on the way we see your fertility potential in a young woman, everything seems to be okay. Maybe due to something, the male side, or we try to limit as many as we can. You put three, you may develop all three, mm. and that you have the triplets. Mm. Some they insist, they insist, they really give us tough time they want and even for that we make them sign they want four you put it and they would d develop a quadruplets but to be honest with our standard we find it a failure if somebody has more than two you failed because three four you see it in the hear it in the news and all that. Really, it's it's not right because the amount of torture the woman goes through to carry these four babies is no joke. And why they normally end up having miscarriages. So the higher the order of pregnancy is the more likely you develop a miscarriage. There are situations where some women uh, themselves uh, from their family uh, background and all that, they can develop the higher order multiple babies okay, and so uh, that is not very common. That is to mean that maybe <laughs> Just one egg was put there, but they may be able to develop twins from that. That training from the one egg yes. is commoner and it's more, <clears throat> it depends more on the genetics of the. Yes. You have a person from a training family, it can't easily happen. Right. So now let's talk about the do's and don'ts when you are about to get an IVF. What should you do? What should you not do? The lifestyle. Um, it's why are you going for the IVF? Whatever is preventing you from getting pregnant, if it's preventable, you should try to avoid it. Smoking, you drinking so much, even your husband always, you know, drinking so much and this is part of the process of not getting pregnant food wise there are several a, a condition where which is related to diabetes for you to have poor egg production mm -hmm. in that case you have to try and with the advice of the doctor to try and sort of manage that situation where your egg production can can be it's a very popular situation called polycystic ovaries syndrome because they call it and then in that case you have to watch what you eat what you so as to you know limit whatever men usually when they are poor low sperm, we ask, encourage them to take um, honey and look, see how we are dressed, me and you. 
we have covered our balls, that we are just like goats and dogs. It should be handy. So this is one of the main reasons. Yes, it should be. Protect and let them be free. Then pregnancy will take place. So avoiding you know, the root of the pregnancy, non-pregnancy causes could help in the, in the situation. IVF is as simple as that. We promote eggs. So even if your eggs can't, you can't promote it because of those, some of the conditions I've mentioned, we are not going to succeed because even though we are doing it, the eggs won't come. Yes, we do get situations where no eggs are produced mm. and we have to cancel the whole cycle. And uh, so uh, anything which will make you your initial doctors will tell you regarding do this or that to promote fertility. It's sort of required in general. There are no specific requirements that I'm going for IVF, therefore I should not drink tea, I should not drink coffee and that sort of thing. I heard them talking about it, but... Uh, it's not true. Okay. So it's, there is no medical basis of it. It's just like the normal care pregnancy thing. Okay. So can you choose the gender of your child? Yes, it's possible. But unfortunately, we don't do it in Ghana yet. I heard some of our colleagues, they've been trying. We call it... Uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. It means before the egg gets stuck in there, we manage to bring one, bring some out. You take a cell out of the developing embryo and study it for whatever you want to. Apart from sex typing, there are some medical conditions where you can diagnose this before the newly made uh, embryo gets implanted. So they take them to the lab, remove one cell from the growing embryo and test it. Sorry. <coughs> Unfortunately, sex typing, it's a bit, it's supposed to be common, especially with the Nigerians, but it's a very expensive way of going through doing what I just described, PGDs. Yes. Finally, I want to know some of the um, lifestyle choices that young people can adopt to reduce infertility rates because sometimes our lifestyles also put us at, at risk of not being able to Very much both in men and women. So before um, you get to the point where you need an artificial um, help to be able to produce, what can you do as an individual to be able to oh, can, Yes, you, you learned something from me. I said the best age to have a baby is... Yes. So that's hours. number one. You don't wait and keep it when you are 38, 40, then you come for a baby. And seriously, it seems the infertility has gone up, infertility problem. It's mainly due to the woman's age. You know, aim to have her own career and therefore a delay. You know, you are postponing your fertility. And it's not only fertility issues. I'm sure you've heard about something called the fibroids. You've heard about endometriosis. Yes. These are all something to do with not the uterus or the system not having a baby. So fibroids take over. Endometriosis take over. My mother had me when she was 46 years. Can you imagine? 
At that time, I said there are no endometriosis and no fibroids. Why? And after me, 46, there were three, a twin and a terrier. Wow. That was my mother. Now, from the little you have gotten from me, how did it okay? How? 46, she was still having a baby. Because she started very early and continued every two years, every like that. So the spacing to is a I mean, we're talking of the scientific aspect of it. Mm. We, I'm not trying to be controversial, but it's a fact that as you delay your fertility thing, these diseases are mentioned, fibroid, and they take over because of what we call estrogens, which come up and they stimulate the growth of the fibroids very much, stimulate. And then at the end of it, you are struggling. Every year, every woman was born with a number of fixed eggs. Listen to this portion. At birth, you have about a million to two million eggs in you as a baby. Then as you grow, 10, 12, 11, you have your first menstruation, that is called menarche. You have lost about 30% of your endowed eggs. And every month that you menstruate, about 40 to 50 eggs come out for only one to stick his neck out. It will also answer you, are there problems with IVF because you are producing more eggs? Is she going to be able to... The eggs that you lose during IVF or you make, you would have lost them anyway in a normal brusher. So yes, age at which you have your family is very important. Young, younger girls, you should be very careful. You should be very careful not to have your tubes damaged from miscarriages, abortions, and things like that. That's very important for the younger ones. Inordinate sex, infections down there, tubal damage, eventually no baby. If, for both sides, male and females, if you had any issues about fertility, don't waste too much time. You go and see the doctor. They will assess you. And the other thing is men. They usually blame women for whatever their problems are. But they are equally culpable. But 40% of infertility is due to men. Thank you very much, Dr. Nana Henaku Labi. He is principal fertility specialist at the Accra Fertility Center, a subsidiary of Medifair Multi Specialist in Fertility Center. And he has been speaking to us about IVF, the procedure, the do's and don'ts, and things that as young people we can do to enhance our chances of fertility. My name is Stella J. Jomsugi. <music>i hope you are doing amazing still in the upper east region currently at a place called sirigu poetry and art and one interesting thing about this place is the fact that this art every pattern has its meaning so we are here to see what they have and here they have amazing art and it's one of the popular tourist attraction places to see in the upper east so i'm here to see it for myself and you guys are coming along with me so let's go let's explore the town i mean this is one of the things you should see when you're in the upper east region so let's go you know me i always take you along so come let's go
um, this is sopa and the word sopa stands for syllable women's organization for cultural and art and this place was found in the year 1997 by native from this community by name Mama since the founder of the place and because they benefited a lot from pottery because her mother was a potter but then those who were doing the pottery there were no many and mostly they were doing it to feed the families but the farmers was doing it also to sell so as they can gather some money to cater for her daughter to go to school and really she was able to make it so she was able to cater for her to go to school so once she complete she became a teacher so she taught for some years then she retired. So once she retired, she also became a manager of all the Catholic schools in the region. And later, she came back into the community where she benefited from. So once she came back, she then honored a few women who were doing the pottery by then. And this was the first building. This was the first building here. So they were meeting here all the time, sharing ideas on how to continue doing the pottery also how to bring the youth so they can also uh, train them. The three colors, the black star for dignity, the red one, danger, then the white one, pure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our former secretary, Mr. Kufiana, late. He was here in 2002, so we put the statue there to remember him. And the painting you see on it, um, always we have this type on top, which stands for leadership. Leadership. Follow by this one. This is a local weaving net. Okay. For storing calabasas. There's one inside with the calabas. Then we have this one. We stand for breaking calabas. This side down here. Broken calabas. So does it have a meaning like yeah. broken calabas? So the broken calabas, the women do those are doing the pottery. Without the broken piece of the calabas, they can't do a pottery here. It's a tool they use for safe also uh, for smoothing. Okay. Yeah. Then this one, yeah, that one stands for togetherness. So, have you noticed this? This is the original color. And to acquire this color, it has to be dyed. So these women are dyeing some. This color looks, is it green or blue? It's blue. Blue. How long does it take to die? Okay. It may take uh, 30 minutes or 45 minutes to die. The unity. Then the one down there. Uh, this one. This is why we call it a misers vaca. What does it mean? A misers is someone's name. So, apart from touring the place, um, what makes it very interesting is the fact that you get to do poetry with the women, you get to do basketry with the women. So I encourage you, we didn't call him initially, so he's trying to get the woman so that we could do some poetry. If you are coming here, I encourage you to call them in advance so that they can arrange the basketry for you. So yeah, this place is beautiful. And the fact that the patterns mean unity, this is um, arm, this is... There's one mean to get to, um, togetherness. This is it's very unique. It's very unique, especially unique in the Upper East region. So let, let's go to the top. Let's see what they have there.
this is how the room looks like this room goes for 100 CDs it comes with a TV a small TV an AC and let's see the washroom it's a very small so we are currently entering the art gallery and these are some of the pots and we are hopefully going to make one of these something cute this is really nice i like the colors CDs. Oh, this is 18 CDs. This big bag is 60 CDs. And yeah. And this is 35 CDs. So it looks like. But I look cute with this bag. Very nice. It just costs 100 Ghana CDs. I'm contemplating if I should get it or not. Um, yeah. Let me know in the comment section if it's something you buy. And I think 100 CDs is really cheap. It's really cheap. I will not say it because in Accra it's so expensive. It's very cheap here. It's 100 Ghana CDs. They have a small bag. Some go for 50, 60, 70, as low as 35. You get some. So this is the clay powder. And this uh the broken the old pot. The old broken pot. Yes. Okay. We're about to start um making our own pot and I'm super excited. I'm super excited. And um, Gloria and I are about to start. So she's currently mixing the clay and the water as you can see. So she made me wet my hands first. It cost us 40 Ghana CDs to have this pottery experience. So I, I, I happen to... Mine doesn't look uh, nice, so she's coming to help clean it up for me. Yeah. Let it come longer, now they say it's breaking. Mr. Ma, this your advice that you give me. Whoa, now it looks much better. So at this point, I am smoothening Guys. the back of my pot, and this is how it looks like so far. Please let me know in the comment section if I'm doing amazing, because I feel I'm doing amazing. <laughs> ah. So Auntie is helping me now, so so my pot can look just like his. His is really looking neatly done. This is how it's going. So, 
This is the end product of our pots. This is how it looks like. Unfortunately, we can't take the pots because if we dry them, they are going to get broken and spoiled. They need to burn them under hot fire. So we're going to leave them. Next time when she comes in, she's going to get them for us. Yes, so that's just it with making of the pot. I hope you enjoyed watching this vlog as much as I enjoyed being here at the Sirugu Pots and Art. <laughs> yeah, until next time with my next video from the Upper East region. I want to say thank you so much for the love and support. I love you all. Until next time on my next video, let me know what you think about this video. Did you find it educative? Did you find it fun? Did you find it exciting? Let me know in the comment section. Until next time, I want to say I love you all as always. You're my favorite person. Mwah. So I got a souvenir from the Sirugu. This is how it looks like. Yay! I really like it. It's a flower vase. And I'm going to keep this forever. Yes, love from the Upper East region. So yeah, we are going. This is the car we came with. It cost us 150 cities in and out. And yeah, our driver has been so helpful. Hi, darling. <laughs> yeah. In case you want to come to the Upper East, just let Stella how I know. We'll link you up with him and he'll tour you around. Yeah. So if you need if you need a driver, um, whenever you're in the Upper East region, he got you sorted. So yeah, we are leaving. Woo! This is the Upper East region. Woo! It is an honor for me to be asked by the President Mills Memorial Heritage to speak at the 10th anniversary event, commemorating the passing of a remarkable human being whom I was privileged to have known from our days at the Faculty of Law, University of Ghana, Ligon. He was three years my senior when we were students, and we later were colleagues when teaching. He was president for just over three and a half years, having served earlier from 1996 to 2000 as vice president. President Mills earned global respect as an exemplar of integrity in political leadership. I want to suggest that the impact of his leadership goes beyond his lifetime, and that now, more than ever, his legacy is critical for our nation's future. We can recall how in death he brought the nation to a unified acknowledgement of his stature in a manner that has been without equal. Even political opponents of his could not help acknowledging what he represented for the country and how his character had been an important stabilizing and moral force for our collective good in that period. I'd just like to ask us at this stage to recall in our minds the national acknowledgement 
when news of his death broke right up to the solemn funeral attended by international dignitaries including the presidents of neighboring Cote d'Ivoire and Togo, Mr. Kofi Annan, and the then US Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. In death, the strength of Professor Mills' personality and his stature as Asim Drihini brought this country together in grief in a very powerful way. I've been excited to learn of the countrywide nature of the memorials that are being organized to honor President Mills and the long-term plans of the memorial heritage. This is because I am convinced that his stature will grow bigger and bigger in the years and decades ahead. I have that conviction because of the outstanding legacy of integrity that he has left behind. That is what I've chosen to highlight today under the theme for these memorial events, the man John Evans at Mills, 10 years on. I believe that his legacy is even more vital today amidst the travails of our nation, as well as what I see as a global crisis of leadership. Today, more than ever, we can appreciate the importance of the human qualities of the man, John Evans, at Fifi Mills. So I would like to start with some remarks about the man. I will then consider how he got into his roles in politics and proceed to outline a few of his important achievements as president. It will not surprise you that I will dwell a bit on achievements in the oil and gas sector and highlight the relevance of those achievements for the future of that sector. It will be my thesis, broadly, that the life and work of President Mills represent a gold standard of leadership which our nation desperately needs. I will be insisting that, especially for our youth, President Mills shines a clear light for our nation's future which we cannot just applaud or even just claim to be inspired by. Our honoring his memory is not so much about raising physical monuments to him, but more, but more about ensuring that his legacy of integrity is given full meaning in our nation and in what we demand of our leaders as well as ourselves. Since Sunday morning, 24th July 2022, we have seen at Asamjui Park, President Mills' resting place, that what is now inscribed over his grave and under his bust does not even have his name. Was he really the one being honored in that event where this inscription was unveiled? But I can almost hear him after listening to me utter those last two sentences saying calmly, Oh, Dama, Mankasa won't why? Oh, really, don't bother about them. And then asking me to move on to the more important subjects that he and I need to discuss. President Mills aspired 
to a better Ghana. That is undoubtedly a shared aspiration we all have as Ghanaians, unless the circumstances are of our absurd partisan politics make some refuse to share that aspiration because it was espoused by someone from a political party other than the one they belong to. We shall look at how even his short time as president saw some important steps he took towards that better Ghana agenda. And more importantly, how his human qualities can help our quest for a better Ghana, our resolve to make our nation great and strong. Let me stress from the beginning that I do not seek to idolize President Mills because that would not even be fair to him. He was a servant leader who never sought to be idolized and he would not accept that. He was indeed a human being and had his limitations and weaknesses just like all of us. What I'm interested to do on this occasion commemorating the 10th anniversary of his death is to distill from his life qualities that are worthy of our attention and emulation. President Mills was a man with a deep devotion to Ghana and to public service. From his days as a lecturer in Legon, teaching both at the Faculty of Law and the School of Administration, his subjects being company law and tax law, through the time of his involvement in the reform of the country's revenue agencies, and then his becoming vice president and eventually president, his life was one dedicated to the country. He did not seek to enrich himself or his family or friends in the cause of any of his commitments to serve. His simplicity, humility, and modesty, combined with his integrity, meant that he was fundamentally seeking the public good and not his personal benefits. As president, he would often sacrifice personal comfort and convenience to spare the nation undue expense on himself. He was frugal about expenditures at the presidency and thus set an example for his staff and for his ministers and other pu public servants. It was never about his entitlements, but rather what the people he was dedicated to serving were entitled to expect from a leader like him. <laughs> Sadly, some believe that politics is all about winning power with no moral boundaries. It's all about enriching oneself. President Mills was the polar opposite of that mentality. On the 18th of June 2008, speaking <laughs> speaking at a forum. Yes, you know what happened on the 18th of June 2008 to me. Speaking at a forum organized by the Institute of Economic Affairs, he said with deep meaning, and I quote, there can be no doubt that the 2008 election is also about leadership and character, about the human qualities of the person into whose hands the people of Ghana are going to entrust their future. I, Atta Mills, bring to the table the core values of truth, honesty, and humility which have guided me through life. I believe political leadership and decency are not mutually exclusive." Unquote. <laughs> Throughout President Mills' political life, he maintained his human decency. 
This was in fact an important part of his political capital. He did not need to make promises or proclamations about his integrity. He lived integrity. <laughs> the fire of integrity was evident in his famous encounter with customs officials at the Terma port when he was calling the officials to order over the corruption among them that was eroding the revenue base of the nation. He could express himself so vehemently and categorically because he himself embodied the virtue he was demanding in others. <laughs> President Mills angrily turned away anyone who tried to make approaches to influence him with money. I recall an account he gave of some business people soon after he was sworn in as president making overtures of arrangements which they indicated they previously had, which they wished to continue, involving making monetary provision for his needs. He drove them away fiercely. <laughs> With a warning that if he heard that anybody in his government was accepting any payment from them, they and the recipient of the payments would be in serious trouble. <clears throat> we all know that it could never be said of President Mills, whether by the chairman of his own party or anybody else, that he himself was receiving everything at the castle and not allowing anything to come to the party. He valued the peace and unity of the country so much that he would not be goaded into seeking political vengeance by making people in the previous administration targets of persecution during his presidency. Though he was under pressure to expose wrongdoing that had taken place previously, he considered that his priority was to focus on the development of Ghana and the well-being of her citizens within a framework of unity. <laughs> President Mills was not one to orchestrate the jailing of people he considered political opponents. <laughs> he absolutely meant it when he said, even before becoming president, that he was going to be a president for all Ghanaians irrespective of political party affiliation. He said in the speech that I quoted earlier, he said so in these words, I'm committed to a decent, honest, humble and truthful government to mend the broken trust between government and the people. I will be president for all Ghanaians, not the NDC, not my family, not my friends. I want to leave an enduring legacy of a peaceful and united country where there is opportunity and prosperity for all. And I want to be remembered as a president who restored honesty, truth, and sincerity to government." Unquote. These words, spoken with conviction and absolute sincerity, reflected the fact that his character was a major part of what he was offering the nation. They reflected his assurance to us that he would not be succumbing to the temptations of political power. He lived up to those declarations Totally. He was a father for all, as indeed a president should be. That may not exactly have been music to the ears of some NDC faithfuls, but President Mills said what he believed was the right thing to do, and he meant every word of what he said. The accolade as Sumjini, King of Peace, conferred on him by popular 
acclamation was a recognition of his preoccupation with the peace and unity of the nation. That was also his nature, his temperament. Peace-loving, soft-spoken, but make no mistake about it, he was firm in his convictions and would not yield to the dictates of others. That it was not worth spilling a drop of blood in the country simply because he was being denied the opportunity to serve as president. <clears throat> However flawed that result was, he decided not to contest it. He obviously believed he would live to fight another day. That was disappointing, even unacceptable to some, but that was his conviction. Being such a peacemaker was not a weakness. It was a mark of wisdom and maturity in a very polarized country. Those who thought his peaceful nature meant they could, have, they could have President Mills do their bidding soon found out to their chagrin that they could not have their way with him. A hockey teammate of his has used the word grit to describe to me how focused President Mills was on the hockey pitch, especially within that half moon in the opponent's half. That grit was to serve him well in his leadership roles and as a person. Of course, he was a great team player and always paid attention to the perspectives of others. This was also very valuable to him when he first got into the NDC and during his service as vice president and chairman of the economic management team. Even as president, he relied on his team in his role as the striker. President Mills had a tremendous work ethic. He applied himself tirelessly to whatever assignment he was undertaking. He could never be accused of laziness. Even in a period when he was not in good health, he kept pushing himself to work right until he had to be taken to the hospital. He knew how to face tough times with a determined spirit and with a focus on what he considered the essentials, an aspect of the grit that was his hallmark. He was insistent on being punctual and would not accept the typical excuses we often make for starting meetings or functions late. Here again, he led by examples. All these attributes of President Mills, his integrity particularly, were anchored in his Christian faith, which clearly gave him the inner strength to be himself and to stand his ground. His faith was a matter of the heart and not about outward appearances or symbols. He understood the words of Jesus Christ in John 4, 23 to 24. But a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. As president, he held a small gathering of worship and prayer on Sunday afternoons in a room between the president's living area and the castle and the office, and that became known as the chapel. There were those who ridiculed this and said he had turned the castle into a prayer camp. I'm told he was at that gathering on the Sunday, 22nd July 2012, before the Tuesday when he died. For President Mills, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1, 21. <laughs> he strove to be Christ-like and chose to build for himself 
treasures in heaven and not on earth. He remained humble throughout his life, never assuming superior heirs over others, always giving thanks to God for his life and recognizing that he was a creature just like others. When he was invited in 1996 by President Rawlings, may his soul rest in peace, to be his running mate, Professor Mills had not previously sought national elective office and had also not been involved in the political arena. He was an academic lawyer, not a politician, and certainly not involved in partisan politics. He was not somebody who sought political office. Rather, he was sought after to hold political office. Mill's integrity, as well as his humility and his dedication to public service, were clearly all character traits which attracted President Rawlings. He was sought after because of the contribution that he was thought he could make for the country and for the person, that is President Rawlings, and the party, the NDC, on whose ticket he was going to run. The choice of running mate at a time when those opposed to President Rawlings had been given a boost by his own former vice president joining their ranks was obviously an important one. Bringing in Professor John Evans Atta Mills proved to be an inspired choice that enabled President Rawlings and the NDC to retain the confidence of the electorate in the 1996 elections. Mills went on to prove himself an able, dedicated, and exemplary vice president. Professor Mills' character and personality, a person of integrity, someone who was peace-loving and not out to seek vengeance against political opponents, were huge positives. And his soft-spoken and gentle manner were an effective complement and balance to President, to, to President Rawlings, whose own integrity and passion for the welfare of the ordinary man were obviously what made Mills accept to be his running mate. We must not forget, of course, that Professor Mills, as he was then, identified himself as an encrumaced and sometimes referred excitedly to the orientation that he received at the Kwame Nkrumah Ideological Institute while a student at Legon. He was therefore very much in tune with the political orientation of the NDC and fitted easily within the tradition. At the time he was announced as the vice presidential candidate, I recall that many of his contemporaries would say of him that he was a good man and then quickly go on to doubt if he could succeed in what they regarded as the dirty world of politics. I will demonstrate that President Mills was a success in politics while not allowing himself to be tarnished by the dirt. He sought to clean up the politics of our nation. By the end of the second term of President Rawlings, he was clear in his mind that the mantle of leadership should pass on to his vice president. There were, however, others in the NDC who thought otherwise, and Professor Mills had to face leadership contests, which now gave him the opportunity to show his political mettle. I believe that a key part of what made him such an attractive presidential candidate for the NDC in the 2000 elections as well as in, two, as well as in 2004 and then in 2008 had to do with his character, precisely his integrity, modesty, and humility. For his selection, as the NDC candidate for the 2008 election, Professor Mills had to withstand the challenge from a number of more established NDC personalities. And his success showed the, the clear grassroots backing from the delegates throughout the country 
for the person who they had not just seen operating as vice president, but whose personality and character had been exposed to them through the 2000 and 2004 election campaigns, and who they now viewed as beginning a new era for the party. So from a situation in 1996, when he could be described as a political neophyte and definitely a newcomer within the NDC, President Mills had become not just a leader and flag bearer of the party, the new face of the NDC, but he was the person who took the NDC from eight years in opposition back to the presidency at the beginning of 2009. That was no mean political achievement, especially when we recall that he did not have at his disposal a fraction of the material resources that the party in government poured into their campaign. He could, not, he could not do anything about the abuse of incumbency. <clears throat> he could not afford the huge expensive billboards of his opponent. True to character, President Mills, Professor Mills then, launched what he called a door-to-door -door campaign, preferring direct encounters with the people whose votes he was courting through the length and breadth of the country. This was derided at that time by those in power. It was poor boy politics. But it has since become recognized as an important strategy for political campaigning in the country even if large, expensive billboards are still, unfortunately, dominating our political contests and defacing our environment. Curiously, ahead of the 2012 elections, President Mills faced a challenge to the renewal of his NDC flag bearership from none other than Mrs. Rawlings, backed by her husband. The overwhelming success of President Mills at the party's Sunyani Congress sealed his position as the leader of the NDC. <laughs> Two things often stand out in my mind about that Congress. The first is the deepening of the support of grassroots representatives of the party for President Mills. That he did not have the backing of President Rawlings on this occasion did not matter to them. The second thing from that Congress that I cannot forget is the speech of his Vice President at that time Vice President John Mahama, who he had selected, you recall, as running mate at a time when others had other preferences. While backing Mills in that speech, Vice President Mahama offered a resounding message couched in a wonderful storytelling style about the need for the unity of the party. President Mills was the person around whom a unified party now rallied. John Evans Atta Mills achieved political success with what I have called the charisma of integrity. Lack of integrity may seem to be politically successful for a time, but sooner or later, the deep human need for honesty and integrity breaks through. That is what we saw happen in Ghana in the election of John Evans at Fifi Mills as president in the 2008-2009 election. His integrity enabled us as a nation 
to call time on a previous era in which corruption was explained away as being as old as Adam. He was the option that exuded honesty, integrity, modesty, and all the character traits we have earlier outlined. At a time when corruption and political vengeance and the abuse of power were on full display from the incumbent government, and when Ghanaians were tired of the cycles of vengeance in our politics and disgusted with all the corruption, with natural resources being squandered for personal enrichment, Professor Mills was a breath of fresh air. Not only did he show that a good man with integrity as his banner can win in politics, but his election showed that character and virtue remain at the heart of human aspiration and that even in politics, integrity matters. <laughs> Deep in our hearts, most of us admire good men and women and we aspire to be like them. Good men and women like President Mills are desperately needed in our politics to rescue us from the mire into which we have sunk. <laughs> we have a responsibility to shape our politics so that good men and women can serve. Mills not only had the charisma of integrity, but also the aroma of integrity. <laughs> Using this commemoration to challenge especially the youth and in all contexts of our national life. <laughs> Needless to say, corruption is more costly to the youth simply because they have a longer span of the future ahead of them. And what is squandered from national resources today leaves the youth with less resources to fix the country to be the country we want, such that we can live the kind of lives that we all aspire to. It is not only in Ghana that the yearning for leaders of integrity is being expressed with more and more urgency. Throughout the world, lack of integrity in leaders is being exposed as unacceptable. Leaders who lie, some repeatedly and pathologically, of empty words that they do not mean. Leaders who are merely flamboyant and pompous, but do not seriously address the needs of their people, are being rejected and seen for who they really are, and not what the political propaganda says of them. Even at the highest levels of global leadership, we have experienced such leaders, including one who lies persistently about an election he lost, and who has obviously provided an example for others about avoiding the truth in dealing with the electoral process. I was recently quite struck by how in a debate amongst candidates for the leadership of the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom, when a question was asked directly, is Mr. Johnson honest? 
with a request of a yes or no answer. Only one person heeded the request, answering no to applause from the audience. <coughs> the person who answered no, I must point out, is no longer in the leadership race. <coughs> None of the others could answer yes. They danced around the question with talk about mistakes having been made and so on and so forth. The person they were talking about was none other than the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom who had led his party to a massive electoral victory only three years ago and yet whose character traits there have been issues about for decades. He is on his way out at last because his colleagues were apparently no longer comfortable with the lack of integrity. One of those colleagues has spoken about how attending a parliamentary prayer breakfast was the moment of truth for him. He says, I was listening to Reverend Les Isaac talking about the importance of integrity in, in, in public life. And just focusing on that, I made up my mind. I went straight back to my office and drafted the resignation letter and went to see the Prime Minister later in the day. Those were the words of Sajid Javid, a former member of the cabinet of Prime Minister Boris Johnson. And in his resignation speech in parliament, he spoke again about the prayer breakfast and about Reverend Liz Isaac speaking about, quote, the responsibility that comes with leadership, the responsibility to serve the others above your own and to seek the common good of your party, your community, and above all, your country. Integrity was again his highlight. The public expects all of us, he went on, to maintain honesty and integrity in what we do. I have concluded that the problem starts at the top. We have also been seeing images recently of the crisis in Sri Lanka, which also tells us that there is a limit to the patience of a country after a long period of tolerance for a country that had been run as if it was a family business. <laughs> and that had failed to address the dire living conditions faced by the people. A once very powerful president has had to flee from his country amidst the angry protests of the people who he had taken for granted for so long. The fact that in recent assessments of risks of debt default globally, Ghana and Sri Lanka are mentioned in the same breath means that we cannot be complacent about our situation. We can perhaps be spared that kind of tragedy in our nation if the commemoration of the life and legacy of President Mills signals us or signals to us a need to follow his example of leadership. I would not be doing justice to the memory of President Mills if it seems that his moral attributes are all there was to the legacy of integrity that I'm talking about. In being elected as president, he undertook to make a difference to the real lives of the people of Ghana. And so it is appropriate to consider how he fared in that regard. We must start with the recognition that President Mills inherited an economy that was in disarray, with the previous government living beyond its means and recording large fiscal deficits in 2007 and 2008. This led to high levels of inflation in those years. The debts owed to two energy sector institutions, VRE and, TR, and TOR alone, by the end of 2008 were almost two billion and rising. Rather than any measures being taken to address the economic imbalances, it was regularly claimed 
that the economy was doing very well. To compound the situation for the incoming government, commitments had been made to the single spine salary adjustments for public servants without any resources being available for this, nor a real plan for revenue generation to meet those commitments. It is to the credit of President Mills that the single spine salary structure was implemented, providing most public servants the benefits of improved remuneration. He was committed to those improved conditions of service because he knew the sacrifices of teachers, of doctors, of nurses, of policemen, of soldiers, judges, officials in the judicial service, all the security service, and public servants generally. The implementation of the single spine salary structure was achieved through improvement in economic management under President Mills, particularly the prudent financial, the prudent fiscal management, which also enabled Ghana to experience significantly lower inflation from January 2009. From a level of 16.5% in 2008, inflation came down to single digits, 9.7% in the very first year of Mill's administration, 2009. In three of the four years from January 2009 to December 2012, Ghana had single-digit inflation. <laughs> Two successive years of single-digit inflation were recorded in 2011-2012. Such lower inflation, by protecting the value of personal incomes, itself improved the well-being of the citizens. Fiscal responsibility was clearly practiced under President Mills. High growth rates were also recorded throughout the period of the Mills administration. Ghana's growth rate in 2011 was among the highest growth rates in the world that year. Some seek to attribute the impressive growth rates and the economic performance under President Mills simply to the onset of oil production from the Jubilee field. No doubt growth in 2011 was elevated by the new revenues, but even non-oil growth in 2011 was higher than growth in the previous years before the Mills administration. <laughs> and this is shown very clearly um, in, in a report. I don't know whether these uh, figures are uh, being displayed to you, but there the, the are clear records of um, the effect of the oil and the non-oil growth which we can refer to. But it is also interesting comparing the level of oil production and associated revenues during the Mills administration with the significantly increased levels in the years from 2017 to date, because this also gives us a perspective. The oil revenues earned in one year, 2018 alone, under the current government, are only about $8 million less than all revenues in the two years under President Mills, 2011 and 2012 when oil began to uh, yield revenues. About 57% of all Ghana's oil revenues since 2011 have been available to the current government, as against 12% that was available to the administration of President Mills. More oil revenue was obtained during the 2017-2020 first term of the current government than in the term of any previous government. 
Despite these high levels of oil revenues, growth rates under the current administration have been consistently lower than under President Mills. Clearly, it is not the amount of oil revenue that matters. It is how that and all other revenues are managed for the benefit of the country. <laughs> Credit cannot be denied President Mills for the improved economic performance, especially in terms of growth and inflation, as against what he inherited and compared to the current government, even though the oil revenue inflow during his period was so limited. There is a disturbing reality about our oil production that we need to pay more attention to than we have been doing. Since 2019, when a level of over 70 million barrels annual production was attained, production has been in decline. In 2021, just over 55 million barrels were produced. Significantly, it was a pipeline of oil and gas development projects from 11 new discoveries that were made during the three and a half years of the presidency that led to the oil and gas production from the 10 and Sankofa and Jinyami fields. It is because of these that the level of oil revenues escalated from 2017. A similar pipeline of appraisal to development projects is urgently needed to reverse the decline in oil production that Ghana is currently experiencing. Ghana is still at a very early stage in uncovering the wealth of our oil resources. And there is every reason to be confident that the decline in production can be reversed for the good of the country. It will, however, require careful, well thought out, technically sound plans driven by what is in the national interest. More immediately, of course, we are faced with the issue of how best to utilize all resources to enable us climb out of our current predicament. The passage of the Petroleum Revenue Management Act 2011, Act 815, was among the important legacies of President Mills. That act set limits to the amounts of revenues from oil production that are expended as part of annual budgets. A stabilization fund was established based on the recognition that some of the revenues needed to be saved. To cushion the impact on or to sustain public expenditure capacity during periods of unanticipated petroleum revenue shortfalls, as it was expressed in Section 9 of the law. Such shortfalls in revenues from oil could arise from a plunge in oil prices or a similar unexpected event. A heritage fund was also established with the stated object being, quote, to provide an endowment for, to provide an endowment to support the development for future generations when the petroleum reserves have been depleted and to receive excess petroleum funds. Transparency and accountability in respect of all revenues and their utilization were also among the key objectives of the Act. And Section 8 provided for publication of data on petroleum receipts as well as petroleum output lifted and reference prices. The savings arrangements have already proved valuable to us as a withdrawal was made from the stabilization fund during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Under the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, investments of the Ghana Petroleum Funds are also required to be made in a manner that insulates them from being spent in annual budgets. Thankfully, therefore, the first half year 2020 report from the Bank of Ghana 
That was published as required by the Petroleum Revenue Management Act on 21st July 2022, the birthday of President Mills, records a closing value of one billion two hundred and twenty three million six hundred and ninety nine thousand and four hundred and ninety three dollars from investments of these funds. In the midst of ominous concerns about possible debt default and debates in Parliament about commercial loans with interest rates that are much higher than the interest being earned on our invested petroleum funds. Is it too much to ask that in the spirit of President Mills and in his honor, urgent, good faith, cross-party and non-partisan consultations are held to enable all our resource pools to be drawn on for the benefit of the people of Ghana? I have no doubt that this is what President Mills would have done. Important issues about the major oil discoveries, Mahogany and Shedria, that became the Jubilee Field Development were on President Mills' table from day one of his administration. And I will now go on to discuss how he handled them. I will do this to demonstrate further that what President Mills did with handling issues and decisions related to the oil and gas resource, what he did provides valuable reference points for issues that we are faced with today in the sector. The critical and urgent matter of approval of a development plan for the Jubilee Field required urgent attention right at the outset of the Mills presidency if national expectations of significant oil production were to be met. Though the Jubilee partners had not yet formally put forward a plan, discussions had been going on that provided outlines of their intent. In particular, the focus of the partners on oil production led to proposals being put forward for an independent gas processing facility whose investors would offtake the gas at the wellhead and then sell to Ghana at $4 per standard cubic foot. There was pressure for this to be accepted quickly, but President Mills would not proceed without a thorough technical evaluation of this and all aspects of whatever was going to go into the development plan. It was in the process of appointing as Minister of Energy, Dr. Otinga J, who he had confidence in to undertake the task. Not long after the appointment of the minister, Cosmos Energy, on behalf of the Jubilee Partners, formally submitted the proposed plan of development. It was apparently their expectation that there would be almost instant approval. Indeed, at a famous meeting at the ministry in early May 2009, the then chief executive of Cosmos Energy rudely told the minister that he, the Cosmos Energy CEO, had decades of experience in the industry and he did not understand why the minister could raise issues with the plan. The first account I had of this behavior at the meeting was from a representative of one of the other partners who had traveled into the country for the meeting. And he indicated that he and the representatives of the other partners were embarrassed by the behavior and utterances of the Cosmos Energy CEO and really impressed by the minister's calm authority. Even as Cosmos and partners mounted pressures, including through their diplomatic missions in Ghana writing to the president, effectively requiring a rubber stamping of their proposed development plan, President Mills firmly backed Minister Otinga J and ensured that concerns raised about the plan were addressed and ministerial approval only granted after the plan satisfactorily advanced Ghana's national interests and in accordance with the laws of Ghana and international industry best practice. In the end, 
Most significantly, as part of the negotiations related to the development plan, the Jubilee partners agreed that rather than their earlier plan in respect of the natural gas, they would supply the first 200 billion feet of gas of their share of gas from the Jubilee field to GMPC free of charge. In return, GNPC would be responsible for putting in place the infrastructure for the offtake of the gas at the wellhead. It is by virtue of this arrangement that rather than Ghana having to pay $4 per cubic foot for buying natural gas, with its impact on the price of power in Ghana, this superior arrangement was instituted and embodied in the approved plan of development. This free gas to GMPC has been an important element of gas supply to Ghana's power sector. <laughs> President Mills was never eager to take credit for such achievements. He would rather give the credit to the minister and the GMPC personnel directly involved in the negotiations. While that was obviously appropriate, there is no doubt that his backing as president was critical in empowering the technically competent personnel to do their work. President Mills would never agree to a situation in which he accepted the proposals of the Jubilee partners and then required the technical personnel to act accordingly. The arrangements to have GMPC responsible for the gas infrastructure led to President Mills on a state visit to China securing financing from the China Development Bank for the construction by Sinopec of gas processing facilities at Atuabo and a gas pipeline to the plant. All this was truly part of the legacy of President Mills. Another challenging issue that soon faced President Mills before the beginning of all production from the Jubilee field was when Cosmos Energy and ExxonMobil publicly announced that they had reached agreement for ExxonMobil to acquire Cosmos Energy. This was something that by the terms of the petroleum law and the agreements under which Cosmos was operating required approval of the government. Yet, it was presented initially as a fait accompli. It soon also emerged that without the knowledge, much less approval, of GMPC, contrary to the law and the petroleum agreements, Cosmos had provided data from their exploration activities in Ghana to ExxonMobil, as well as over 20 other companies in the industry. It was again the expectation of ExxonMobil and Cosmos that their transactions should be rubber stamped and issues about the illegalities overlooked. As U.S. companies, ExxonMobil and Cosmos brought the full weight of the U.S. government to bear on the government of Ghana to support their position. The U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, for Africa, for, for African Affairs, uh, Johnny Carsons, and others weighed in on President Mills to give in to the U.S. companies. Cosmos also hired a lobbyist to work on their behalf and to wage a campaign. Nasty articles surfaced in the U.S. press, notably the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Times, and Forbes, against the government and individuals believed to be against the transaction. Famously, a visa was denied the chairman of GMPC, Mr. Tuahoy, who was to have traveled to the U.S. for meetings with Blackstone Capital, majority shareholders of Cosmos Energy. Not being intimidated by all this campaign, President Mills made it clear to the U.S. officials that he had nothing against the U.S. companies, but that the laws of Ghana must be respected, and that he, as president, would pursue the national interests of Ghana. He set up a committee headed by a distinguished Ghanaian economist at the World Bank, Dr. Gobin Nankani of Blessed Memory and others. The committee was tasked to evaluate the various 
options of partnership op open to GMPs, including ExxonMobil, as well as a consortium featuring BP and the China National Offshore Oil Corporation. Based on the work of the committee, President Mills again backed the minister and GMPC in pursuing a rival offer for Cosmos Energy that matched that of ExxonMobil. In the end, however, ExxonMobil, after Cosmos Energy shareholders sought to get more out of the transaction, announced that it would no longer proceed with the planned acquisition. Cosmos Energy also soon announced that it was no longer for sale, but was rather going to do an initial public offering on the New York Stock Exchange. Prior to the start of oil production from the Jubilee Field, Cosmos reached agreement with GMPC on the government on the, on the issue of illegally sharing GMPC data with third parties, and they paid $23 million, even though they refused to admit liability. <laughs> I, I should just add a little footnote to the lobbyist that I mentioned who was hired by Cosmos Energy to wage their campaign uh, to try and get their way in connection with the ExxonMobil acquisition. She was the same person in 2016 hired by the campaign of then candidate Akufuado for the 2016 election. And she uses her engagement in that campaign as a case study on the website of her company with the title Unseating the Incumbent in Ghana's Presidential Election 2016. You can, you can read that case study at their website krlinternational.com dash case study Ghana election. The integrity of President Mills his reliance on rigorous technical evaluation of options, his empowering of technocrats and the relevant institutions such as the ministry and GMPC at the time to do the groundwork that was needed for sound government decision making, his relentless pursuit of the national interest all served Ghana well. The onset of significant oil production could have accentuated corruption and self-seeking at the expense of the nation. President Mills would have none of that. If our efforts to achieve the best for our nation from our resources are to succeed, the clarity of focus on the national interest that President Mills had represents a constant lodestar for decision making. It is not my intention today to deal with every aspect, every area of significance in the better Ghana agenda of President Mills. I will only deal briefly with one final area that is currently under discussion from a variety of perspectives. That is the issue of review of the Constitution. A high-powered Constitutional Review Committee was set up by President Mills, chaired by Professor Albert Fiaggio, a distinguished academic. It is unfortunate that the important work of this committee is not informing much of the talk of constitutional reform. I have no doubt that it will be beneficial for those concerned about constitutional reform to benefit from the important work, not only of this review committee, but also the work of the committee under the chairmanship of Nana Dr. SKB Asante, which worked on the 1992 constitution and presented it to the consultative assembly. Nana chairman, I recall that you were a member of that 1992 consultative assembly and that you were also a member of the 1979 constituent assembly that drew up the 1979 Constitution. So you are eminently qualified to speak with authority and to draw attention, for instance, to how much work on the 1992 Constitution 
took the 1979 constitution as a starting point. I humbly request people like you to speak up because there is, I have to say, some very uninformed talk about the 1992 constitution that gets an audience. When I, I hear a call for review of the constitution, that is based on the wholly false promise, the wholly false premise that it was a constitution just designed for flight left and rollings. I wonder if it is just ignorance or brazen falsehood or perhaps a toxic combination of the two that is on display. You, Nana Chairman, played a history-making role together with others in respect of the Constitution. And I hope, therefore, you will not be offended by my request. Many aspects of our current predicament as a nation, in any case, are not addressed by constitutional reform. When we're dealing with corruption and its negative impact on our development, when we talk about the weak institutions that we have, or the complicity in wrongdoing of people supposed to play important roles to check abuse of power, changing provisions in the Constitution will not resolve those issues. When we talk about issues concerning remuneration for Article 71 office holders, it is not really an issue of constitutional reform. It is an issue of what a state with limited resources should pay to various people in public service and the relativities of different levels and contexts of service. The single spine salary adjustment process involved some consideration of relativities, which will always be important. It is understandable that concerns arise as to why part-time work as a member of the Council of State should go with a level of monthly remuneration that is about 20 times that of a full-time teacher and with an end-of-service package as well. More especially when a number of the members of the Council of State retired on their salaries as public servants. In all this, we each have our personal responsibility for assessing what is the right thing for the nation. It is the essence of the legacy of integrity of President Mills that it was never about himself but always about the welfare of others, the good of the nation. Discussions for reform of the Constitution are important and necessary, but they must not distract attention from pressing issues about harsh living conditions, issues about the crisis of the economy and excessive borrowing and so on, nor be a way of taking away, of, of taking the focus away from addressing the corruption that is rampant in our midst. I have chosen today to use the memory of President Mills to call attention to the fundamental need for integrity in public life, in politics, in those who seek or hold leadership positions. I believe that we pay a heavy price for our failure to insist on integrity as a necessary qualification for those who seek high office. It is unfortunate how we shut our eyes to corruption when it is from our party, and so we lack the moral authority to confront corrupt practices by others. President Mills built on his personal integrity to deliver leadership success and initiate the Better Ghana Agenda. He showed that integrity, <laughs> integrity mattered to deliver economic benefits because 
it is the integrity deficit that regularly gets translated into fiscal deficits. He was effective in delivering on governmental goals because of his integrity. At this critical time in our nation's existence, at this time of economic crisis, of social unrest and political disaffection, President Mills, as the standard bearer of integrity, beckons us all to establish better governance as the basis for a better Ghana. Better governance is about making our institutions work effectively and not just for our party members. It, it is also not about coveting power for an individual or for the party. It is about serving the whole polity. That is what President Mills meant by being a president for all and not just for members of his party. I quote some further words of his in that June 18, 2008 speech, which have a chilling resonance. He said, is it not ironical that seven or eight years is long enough to make some elected officials and their families fabulously wealthy. And yet they say eight years is too short a time to solve problems of poverty for the generality of the masses. End of quote. President Mills beckons the youth of this country especially to make a foundation of integrity the bedrock of our nation building. The youth recognize starkly that their current existence and their prospects for the future are jeopardized by the lack of integrity in our nation, by leaders who frankly have less of a stake in the future that lies ahead, but who make fulsome promises for electioneering purposes. Today, President Mills' integrity, his good judgment, his wisdom can still guide us in making the right decisions that the oil and gas sector, for instance, that I discussed at some length, can be a driver of national development and well-being of all Ghanaians and not a source of corrupt personal enrichment. The legacy of integrity of President Mills is so important today in Ghana. Integrity matters. Speaking the truth matters. Character matters in nation building. Indeed, integrity, honesty, speaking the truth, virtue are fundamental to human existence. And so they are important in political life and in political systems. Without these basic human qualities, there is no trust among members of society, and we risk a descent into anarchy. That is why the legacy of President Mills needs to be embraced and become a guiding light for us. I encourage the memorial heritage to propagate the message of what President Mills stood for and the relevance of his life and legacy to our country. His integrity, his humility, his modesty, his sheer decency, his hard work are all worthy of emulation if this country is right if, if this country is to rise up to its promise. I'm really touched by the message from First Lady Nadu Mills to us today. Allow me to quote her as I end. Fifi was often battered and bruised on the battlefield of politics, but he held firm 
to his personal values of truth, simplicity, honesty, and abiding respect for all. These are the qualities I loved about him. To Fifi, serving at the highest echelons of government was an opportunity to help change the character of Ghanaian politics for the better. In this regard, I believe posterity will judge him well. I, I believe so too. The legacy of President Mills lives on. I miss President Mills. Thank you. Honourable members, prayers. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to look with favour upon this Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. Grant that it may be as in thy sight. Give divine guidance to the President of the Republic. And thou members of Parliament and ministers of state with discernment and vision integrity and courage that through the labors of government this land and people may be well and truly saved and that good purposes for the common human life be realized in our midst amen O oh god grant us a vision of our country fair as it might be a country of righteousness where none shall wrong his neighbor a country of plenty, where evil and poverty shall be done away with. A country of brotherhood, where all success shall be founded on service, and honor shall be given to the deserving. A country of peace, where government shall rest on the will of the people, and the love for the common good. Bless the efforts of those who try to make this vision a living reality. Inspire and strengthen our people that they may give time, thought, and sacrifice to speed the day of the coming beauty of Ghana and Africa. Amen.
members, we have a message from His Excellency the President. This is quite some time ago, but I'm informed the House was not told about the contents of the message. The letter is dated 26th June 2022. It reads, absence from Ghana. In accordance with Article 59 of the Constitution, I write to inform you that I'll be traveling outside the country to Lisbon, Portugal, in the evening of Sunday, 26 June 2022, to lead Ghana's delegation to a 2022 United Nations Ocean Conference at the invitation of His Excellency Antonio Guterres, United Nations Secretary General, to be held from 27 June 2022 to 1 July 2022. I will return to Ghana in the afternoon of Wednesday, 29 June 2022. During my absence, the Vice President, Alayi Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia, shall, in accordance with Article 68 of the Constitution, act in my stead. Yours sincerely, Nana Adudankwa Akufuadu. Honorable members, item four correction of votes and proceedings and official report. We will start with the correction and votes of proceedings of Friday, 22nd July, 2022. Page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. Page six. Page seven. Page eight. Page nine. Page ten. Page eleven. Page twelve. Page 14, sorry, page 13. Page 14. Page 15. Page 16. Page 17.
page 18. Page 19. Page 20. Page 21. Page 22. Page 23. Twenty-five, page twenty-six, page twenty-seven, page. 28 page 29 page 30 page 31 32 page 33 page 34 page 35 Yes, page 35. So speak up, page 34. Page 34. Yes, please. Item 3. In attendance, Roman number 3. Mr. Muhammad Hadi Tuferu, who is Honorable MP and Deputy Minister for Food and Agriculture, in line with the reporting of others, because that day he represented the sector minister as Deputy Minister. Yes, table office. Kindly capture what is drawn our attention to. Page 35. Page 36. Yes, page 36. I'm going to write on the speaker. Write on the speaker, page 36, item number XXVII. It should be National Service Personnel. And not, and not person. I'm going to yes. the table of his kindly take note. Page 37. Page 38. Page, page 38, yes. Uh, speaker, I may have to indulge you to bring you back to page 15. Uh, and that one will require some a directive from you when you come to page 15 the clause 33 
I'm sure the draft person can despise subsection 4, part A and part B of the third schedule of the Customs Act. It's hereby. We don't use the word are hereby. But that's what I'm saying. We need to look at the, the, the note. Um, and if the speaker authority is to Page, direct, uh, page 15. Yeah, page 15, Mr. Speaker. Number? Uh, number 10. Yes. Clause 33. The third line, Act, third schedule of the Customs Act 2015, Act 891, are repealed. It's hereby, it's hereby repealed. It's appropriate. But I, they have to go back to their record. But whatever it is, for the speaker to direct the draft person to look at it. I don't know, but uh, when you say I repealed 90 days, it shouldn't reflect uh, this house. It's bad construction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, uh, Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, I believe, as he's saying, as the minority leader is saying, we can leave it to address persons. But indeed, when he says that it should read, it's hereby repealed, we're talking about two things. It says, despite subsection 4, part A and part B, you cannot say the two is, certainly is R, but as regards adding the word hereby, uh, I have nothing against it. I'm saying let's leave it to the dress persons. But if you are combining parts, two parts, certainly it's plural and it cannot be covered by AC. But, but let's leave it to the dress persons. Yes. Of his country, draw the attention of the draft person to look at the rendition again. We got to which page? Sorry. Page 37. Page 38. Page 39. Page 40. Page 41. Page 42. Page 43. Yes. <clears throat> right now, Speaker, same correction on page 43, item number CXX on the National Service uh, Personnel. And uh, if it can be corrected across the board, there's another one on the next page. I'm grateful, Mr. Speaker. Table office, take note and make the consequential corrections to all. National Service Personnel, not National Service Person. Page, yes, please. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, I would like to take you a little bit back to page 40 and seek your guidance and directions. I'm not aware that we have any district called Lower Lower Deitra District, but we have captured 
at page 40, item, I think, LXXVII, where we have Mrs. Mabel Hyde Amwa. It's reported accountant, lower digital district. But I was just seeking guidance from the health people if in terms of health uh, directory, they have a separate district from what we have in terms of political administration. But I'm told that is not the case. I do know we have in my lower digital district and not lower digital district. So if it can be corrected, thank you. Member, I'm not sure myself, so I will direct the table office to look at it and capture the proper nomenclature for the district. Page is it 43 or the same page? All right, that's page 40. Yes, right on speaker, right on speaker. The Honorable Kofi Adams is right. I just checked and I noticed that it's uh, it should be Chefu, Iman Lower Dentura District. So Chefu, Iman Lower Dentura District. The capital is uh, Chefu Praso. So Chefu Stroke, Iman Stroke, Lower Dentura District. I'm grateful, Mr. Speaker. All right, table office. Please take note and capture it properly. Page 44. Honorable members, the votes and proceedings of the 33rd sitting held on Friday, 22nd July 2022, as corrected are adopted as the two records of proceedings. members, I'm going to suspend sitting for the next 30 minutes. I want to meet the leadership at the lobby. So sitting is accordingly suspended for 30 minutes. to the equivalent of six million three hundred and eighty nine thousand four hundred and twenty eight United States dollars on materials and equipment to be procured for the development of the Meridian Hotel by 4MAC Limited. Honorable members, the paper has been laid accordingly and it is referred to the Committee on Finance. Number 6A, Roman 2. Request for waiver of import duties, import VAT, NHIL, get fund levy, exim levy, and special imports levy, and COVID-19 levy amounting to Ghana CD equivalent 
of 9,252,755 euros on materials and equipment to be procured for the rehabilitation and equipping of La General Hospital in Accra by Messrs. Polichengda Overseas Engineering Company Limited of China. Honorable members, the reply is also laid accordingly and referred to the Committee on Finance for consideration and report to the House. Number 6B, by the Chairman of the Committee, Roman 1. Yes, speak out to me now. My information is that um, the Committee has exhausted the consideration of those items listed under B. So we stand the B down until there is a congruence of opinion on that, and then we may come back to that. In the meantime, the Speaker, we could go to item listed as 7, page 5. Honorable members, the Application before us is for S27, which is presentation and first reading of bills. Item, yes. Mr. Speaker, rightly so. Um, item 6B, the report of the committee is not ready. So I agree that we can jump to the presentation of. Uh, presentation and first reading of bills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, there is no problem. There are other reports. I don't know whether they are also not ready. Like um, the one on rules and transport, and the one on employment, social welfare, and state enterprises. There are two reports, actually. Yes, Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, the C is um, the commercial contracts agreement, and the <coughs> Committee on Finance should finish with their own consideration before we submit their reports. That is why we have to stand that one down. Mr. Speaker, the other one, D. The Honorable uh, Dr. Kwabena Donko had some discussions with me. I don't know where they are with the report. If the reports are ready, then they could be late. Uh, yes, I thought the I thought the C was from the Committee on Roads and Transport. The Finance Committee might have looked at it, but the report is coming from the Committee on Rules and Transport, which is a contract agreement. They that's, might have looked at that's it, but the I... Committee on Rules and Transport had to present the report. Mr. Speaker, that is why I'm saying that the, the uh, loan agreement, they must finish with it first. So the Committee on Rules and Transport could also consider this. It may refer to them, though, but they have to wait until the um, the report, the agreement is authenticated by the Finance Committee before the, the work on it. What about the E? The Committee of Privileges. The D, the chairman is unavailable, and the ranking member who spoke e, to me. E, E, E. The E, the chairman is there. So he could do the. Is he ready? Yes. yes, so we can go ahead to lay that report. That is item. 6E at page 5 of the order paper. Report of the Committee of Privileges on the alleged breach of Article 97 1C of the 1992 Constitution and Order 16 1 of the Standing Orders of Parliament by three honorable members of Parliament during the first meeting of the second session of the 8th Parliament of the 4th Republic of Ghana. Honourable Members, the report has been laid accordingly and is for distribution to all members of Parliament. Now we move to item 7, presentation and first reading of bills. 7A, National Vaccine Institute Bill 2022, Minister for Health. 
the speaker, the deputy minister for health is here, so he could she could also present a paper on behalf of the minister. Honourable deputy minister, you can go ahead, unless you have yes. The speaker, I was with the minister for health in your office, Thank you very much. and today is a very busy day. How? The deputy minister to do whatever. If you continue today being the budget day, the ministers must help them out here to be laying those documents. The speaker, today being a special day, nobody should be giving any excuse. He was here this morning. If he's not ready, we can go and do other business. When he comes, then he lays the paper. The, the speaker, this, at this stage, we are not dealing with a second reading of, of the bill. It's just presenting the bill to the house, which should come from the ministry. The minister himself was with us, but he has just hesitated. I'm informed that he's using the washroom. And because of that, the house should be held in abeyance. I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure that is the way to proceed. Yes, please. The speaker, this is our own. The Minister for Health. When he was called upon to go and present document at the court, he went. If he must go and lay present document here, he must come. This is what I mean. We must take the work of Parliament serious. When a high court call, you go there and go and lay documents. Come and lay documents in Parliament. That one too, you are saying that your deputy must lay that. So, speaker, we must let ministers take this house very serious. Just as they take other high court serious. Yeah. Yes, majority. Yeah. I honestly don't think that. Yeah. I honestly don't think that we should be splitting heads. <laughs> we should be splitting heads over this. <laughs> and and the, the, the shouting battle that my colleague wants to encourage in the house. I decline that offer to engage him in the in shouting match. I decline that offer. The minister will join us. If we have the speaker. Okay. The, the second one is the Grains Development Authority Bill. The minister was here to do just that. Unfortunately, because we had to um, suspend sitting, he's also left. Um, I told him to be back at one though. So I don't know whether <coughs> members will indulge the the um, any other minister to do the presentation on behalf of the minister. That is 7B. Honorable members, we move to item 7B. 7B. Yes. Speaker, the Minister for Roads and Highways is here. So if I may seek leave for him to present the paper on behalf of the Minister for Agriculture. Yes. The, the speaker, as a house, we must take the work of the ministers that we give approval to, to do business with are very serious. If a minister is un, unable to appear before this house and do a business, we demand a reason for the absence, absence of the minister to be convinced now, this minister takes us very serious, but because of A, B, C, D, that is why he's unable to come. But to say this minister is not here to do the work, the speaker, it's not enough. We must, we demand reasons for the non availability of the ministers to do business in this very special day, where we are going, the, the budget of those sectors are going to be presented this, to this house. We must sit here and listen together with them. So if there will be a day at all where an excuse could be given to a minister. It should not be today. A budget day, the speaker, we demand the ministers must be here. 
Yes. It's just because I really cannot fathom what is happening. The minister responsible for agriculture was here. And the speaker, before you suspend the city, I rose in order to catch your eye to allow the minister to do the presentation of the paper. The other side, it was who signal that they were going to a, into a caucus. And you went into a caucus for one and a half hours. We expected the minister to stay here. Mr. Speaker, so we signal the minister who goes away. Can you please sit down? We are not in the marketplace, please. So, Mr. Speaker, if the insistence is that if the minister is not here, the paper should not be laid, fair and fine. But it is not attributable to the minister. In this case, it is you yourself who said you are moving to a caucus. And you were not here. And you had to hold the house in abeyance for one and a half hours. You turn around to be accusing the minister that he's not taking the house serious. Mr. Speaker, that certainly is unacceptable. Honourable Members, item 7C. 7C. Honourable MP for Medina. To Esther Kuntevio. An act to amend the Grain Development Authority Act. Seven C, seven C. Mr. Speaker, yes. You you may recollect that we have had some discussions on these matters, and we were trying to reason it out as to the way to proceed on these matters. So I thought that maybe we'll stay action on these private members' bills until the discussion that we had together with the, the uh, minority leader to firm the position of the House on these discussions and then move forward. Mr. Speaker, so respectfully, I would urge that maybe we stand this down for the time being. Now, in the meantime, the Minister for Agriculture is here so that we can, we can do his own um, 7B. Yes, Ma Minority Chief. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm surprised at the comment from the Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, this house runs on rules and procedures. And when this has been done, gone through all the day, it's not on the other people for laying. What discussion is he talking about? We should refer to your committee. Whilst they are working, whatever suggestions, discussions it takes, you can go to your committee and do it. Just as we are doing with the other government business. So, Mr. Speaker, I think it's only fair that we call on Honorable Sosu to lay item D as programmed by the business committee and appear on the other paper so that whatever suggestion the majority that we have, you can go to your committee and have it so that it will be part of the report to the House. But at this stage, we are delaying our papers, a paper that has gone through the due process of the House, and has found itself on the other paper. Mr. Speaker, we can only call on you to call on the member to lay the paper. Thank you very much. Yes, Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, certainly this is not a private matter. It has nothing to do with me. I had a discussion with the Speaker on having a policy position on these matters. And we are to invite the minority leader, think through, and we are already thinking of some vehicle to use in these matters. That is a reminder I was giving to the speaker. So it has nothing to do with me as an individual. Honorable members, the majority leader drew my attention to the fact that he has an issue with some of the private members' bills that are being considered by the House. But specifically, he mentioned the Budget Act. The Budget Act, because he thought Article 108 is a provision that has to be considered. Even though the former Speaker ruled that members could 
present private members' initiatives in the form of bills to the House, we thought that we have to reconsider some of these in view of the provisions of Article 108. But specifically, it was in reference to the Budget Act, not these amendment bills. And so I believe that we can go on with these amendment bills. Any concerns could be during the deliberation of the committee or the whole House. These bills have been under consideration for quite a long time. And I think we should give members and, and, and encourage members to make these initiatives for the consideration of this. It's just an amendment which I think all the stakeholders, all partners have participated in the discussions. And I don't think that we should delay anymore. I believe that item 7, C and D could be laid by the sponsors of those bills. So please. 7C, Honorable Member for Medina. An act to amend Forces Act 1962, Act 105, to substitute the penalty of life imprisonment for the death penalty and to provide for related matters. Honorable Members, the amendment bill has been laid accordingly and referred to the Committee on Constitutional, Legal, and Parliamentary Affairs for consideration and report to the House. Yes, Honorable Katie Hammond. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Look, I have a view to express. Kindly let me do it as your class prefect. Speaker, it's not so much by reference to Article 108, even though that underpins the point, Mr. Speaker, I intend to make. Mr. Speaker, for the many years that you and I, Mr. Speaker, have been in this house. The view had uh, variously been taken by respective uh, speakers that we should be very careful about private members' bill. We are, eventually, there was a ruling that it could be done. But I thought that, Mr. Speaker, there was a serious caveat about whether members could bring a private member's bill or not. Yeah, what we've seen recently is the number, the load, and the speed with which private member's bills have been introduced in the House. What is troubling me now, it is not so much about the financial implications the speaker, of some of these private member bills, but the security implications. Come to think of it, there is a private member's, private member's bill speaker, for amendment to the armed forces. There can't be any serious security uh, aspect and implication to any bill, Mr. Speaker, then uh, an amendment to the armed forces, Mr. Speaker, act. I do not think that, Mr. Speaker, it behoves any member of the House, Mr. Speaker, to seek to tamper with the an act as a Honourable member, you are completely out of order. You are completely out of order. The House has developed a guidelines. There are guidelines as to how private members' bills should be processed. Those guidelines have been gone through by the proposers. All stakeholders, including the armed forces, have been part of the discussions and deliberations. I've been following all the private members' bills. I've been following through to make sure that our rules are not breached by any member of parliament or anybody submitting a private member's bill. I have gone through all that. It's after that the draft person.